Hey everyone, Douglas here, and welcome back to the MMT Macro Trader and the uh, now quite consistent Wednesday live stream. I am here with my sidekick, Bijou. Um, welcome to the stream. Hello, Jesus. Actually, I want to switch to this view right here. Thank you. Um, yeah, welcome, Jesus. Yes. Uh, yeah, if you are here, say hi. Hit the like button. <laughs> that that gets us going. Um, that, that's how you know it's going to be a good stream. We have lots of likes. Uh, funneling in right away. Uh, what's going on, Josh? WWE fan. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thanks for saying hi. I think we got a good one. Um, we have a lot to talk about kind of out of the gate market-wise. I want to give some thoughts on the market. Tomorrow is a very big day. Uh, as the uh, as the CPI data, the inflation data is hitting at 8:30 a.m. So if you're a market watcher, pay attention <laughs> to that uh, that data dropping tomorrow morning. Always fireworks, especially. Actually, I remember back when the CPI data dropping was uh, was just a, 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 an absolute yawn of uh, of a market day. But um, things have changed, so the CPI data is going to come out tomorrow. That'll certainly shake things up. We'll talk about that. We have inflation on the docket and um, yeah, rate hikes, that whole that whole thing. One of these days, I'd love to move on from that and we can just get back to other things, but certainly that is dominating the headlines right now. Um, yeah, quick market update though. We had the jobs data last Friday. We saw markets really take off last Friday after the jobs data. Monday, we continued the rally, and then Tuesday, things kind of started to fizzle out, and then today, we saw a resumption of that rally. So as it stands right now, things are setting up to uh, to have a, a little bit of a bullish potential here. And even if you just kind of look at the chart, we've tested this 200-period moving average or the 200-day moving average on the S&P quite a few times now during this entire bear market. We are once again at that juncture. It just feels like an inflection point. We'll see if you're an MMT, uh, if you're on the uh, MMT uh, macro trader Patreon feed. I did drop the data uh, tonight, the uh, daily dashboard tonight. Take a look at that. There's some good, good data in there. Uh, we saw a change in the vol shift model, uh, which is to be a bit expected given the rally that we've seen. But definitely, uh, definitely check that out. I don't know necessarily whenever big data drops, you know, I, I don't want to get my expectations up one way or another. Um, but definitely tomorrow, um, if, if we can continue to see the rally that we've started going and it kind of continues and we don't see a complete collapse in price, I really think we could uh, start to see a bit of a rally emerge here, at least till the end of this OPEX cycle. And, and if you are, uh, if you are also again, a Patreon member, uh, the most recent, uh, macro update went over that as well. Um, that came out uh, last night. So check that out also. And I kind of go over more detail, kind of what to expect, but anyway, big day tomorrow, CPI data drops. And the way I look at the CPI data is, um, and really any of these data drops, one, again, it's really the hedging activity that I'm more interested in. And then two, um, what's also uh, of interest to me is to try and figure out <laughs> what it is, and I got to make sure I say this right, like what it is the Fed is going to do based on the data, based on their misunderstanding of the data, and then what are market participants going to do based on whatever it is their understanding of the data is and based on whatever their understanding of what the Fed is going to do based on the data. Also understanding that most market participants probably get that wrong as well. So it's one big, let's figure this out to the best of our ability um, to see what's going to happen. and <laughs> Agent-based simulations. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That is, uh, that is exactly what we're going to need is a good agent-based simulation, Bijou. Uh, maybe something we can talk about. In fact, actually, we had a question a little bit about like uh, uh, kind of down that path last week about how can we kind of interpret uh, price data as it, as it gets presented on charts. Is there any information in there? And we think that maybe one way you could do that is in agent-based modeling. But um, yeah, I don't know. I think I think even even trying to determine, um, trying to understand how people will understand what it is the Fed thinks they understand and how they're going to react to that might break even the most powerful of supercomputers. So, um, nevertheless, I, it seems like a, a worth. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I kind of tend to agree. Right? Yeah, yeah. We we might need so to much going on and uh, 
build a, a quantum computer um <laughs> to yeah yeah with uh well yeah you can you can it's talk all about the functions. the uh the non-traversable wormhole tunneling yeah. <laughs> whatever that we'll yeah, need yeah. to do <laughs> we'll need to do that <laughs> agent based uh that's right ty there's no such thing as agent based models there are only uh systems uh, system dynamic models that exist <laughs> Uh, we don't want to work from, from the ground up. Um, yeah, so, so we'll see how tomorrow plays out from a market standpoint. I, I did do, some, I did do some, some research on some data that I will share tonight as we get in a little more into the live stream regarding inflation, some thoughts that I've had that I've uh, kind of mini models that I've wanted to piece together that I finally got around to and, and we'll share the initial finding. We'll see how valuable they are down the line. But um, that is where we are at. I, I do, bees. You cut in at any time too, if you, you, know, you have any thoughts or something like that. Um, we're still kind of waiting for people to trickle okay. in. Appreciate the likes, by the way, uh, as you guys trickle in. Love to see the um, love to see. Oh yeah, I know, Ty. You know some of the things with the agent-based modeling stuff. I mean, I, I really think you there's <laughs> there's some stuff to be had there. I, I'm sure, Ty, you've seen. Uh, is it Tim Gooding's work? Um, I mean, I, I think the stuff that he put together is a good starting spot for understanding how you can kind of build agent-based models for an economy, for finance, for that sort of thing. So um, it is certainly on a to-do list. Um, one thing I do want to talk about is kind of the big news story right now, which is the debt ceiling. Um, and just kind of give a few thoughts here. It's it's really obviously the the mint the coin thing, great idea. I mean the debt ceiling in and of itself is just a self imposed uh, uh, restriction on spending. It's not some natural law. It's kind of a vestigial of of a bygone era, at best. I mean at worst, it's just a really bad policy. And so the 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 mint the coin movement is to try and bypass this nonsense that happens every year like clockwork. Um, as, as the debt ceiling gets weaponized. And I'll, I'll say in, in and of itself, the, the debt ceiling issue uh, is not, I mean, it, it, because it is a self-imposed constraint, it will be overcome, right? I mean, it, it's, it's not like, a, again, it's, it's not like the law of gravity that we, <laughs> you, know, you have to fight against. You can just remove it. Right. And, and certainly um, the, when push comes to shove, policymakers will find a way to remove it. But what it can do in the short run, and it'll probably be six months until we get to this point, give or take, but it can absolutely clog up the plumbing of, uh, of particularly short-term money markets, that sort of thing, uh, overnight lending within banks. That's where a lot of the damage can really happen. And then if it gets extended for whatever reason, then you might see a play into the real economy, especially if uh, checks get held up, whether that be Social Security or payments out to uh, uh, for, for Medicaid, Medicare, uh, that, that sort of thing. Um, that can really be that can really be problematic, um, but the the short term is that if we do hit the debt ceiling and and what the Federal Reserve calls it, its extraordinary measures, uh, which is just tapping into various uh, streams of of income, essentially you're creating uh, kind of side accounts that'll get paid pay back later. However, they shift around and, and do their balance sheet operations. They can continue to make sure the checks uh, you know the checks go out and and what have you. But certainly, um, it's it's political high season to create any any tension whatsoever. Um, to, to gain some political points, and we could certainly see that. So that is a, uh, you know, I mean, that's a, just a, a fear on the horizon and any fear on the horizon. The hedging activity does play because of that. I mean, that people are going to take hedges out, and that hedging activity right. is kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy when it comes to markets. So bear that in mind. Again, it's a self-imposed. You go with the self-fulfilling yeah. self yeah. feedback. It's all agent based again. <laughs> if anyone has an idea for a simplistic agent based model of the debt ceiling, uh, you know, does it psychology plus the central bank psychology, then yeah, let us know. <laughs> yes. It, it, it can't be all that complicated, actually, because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, it's about like we were discussing offline earlier this week. Douglas about um you know you just need the inside information um but you know mostly that's like in the deviously unencrypted channel of c-span yeah yeah it is uh i'm gonna put my ear my my headphones on real quick um 
you know, I was I was watching some of the circus as it as it rolled into town last week um, on C-SPAN. It was great free entertainment. Me and my buddies were all chatting about it, hooting and hollering at every dumbass thing that was being <laughs> said by our politicians. Of course, the worst of the things that were being said. And it seems like there's a consensus, and this maybe the next step that I want to take is, uh, I mean, it does seem like there is a lot of consensus uh, to start to cut spending, uh, do tax cuts. <laughs> Ironically, obviously, yeah. the Republicans don't know uh, how the how the fiscal lovers actually work. Um, but it, I mean, it does seem like uh, kind of a quasi austerity is uh, kind of a quasi austerity is is being proposed, and it seems like I mean, I, I, yeah. I you know, I don't know. And maybe you can answer. Maybe Chet can answer. I, I don't. I think I've heard Biden multiple times say that it's definitely a goal of his to get our spending in order. I mean, the deficit certainly seems to be on his radar. Um, I, you know, I, I don't. But, I don't know what the what the impact would be. Yeah. How do you how do you emulate Clinton? Uh, you know, without emulating Clinton, make it seem as though you're being fiscally responsible mm -hmm. but then actually be fiscally responsible by running the investments it's, a, it's an interesting little dilemma for a, a politician who, who understood mt right but who was still you know scared of the political psychology implications is you know how do you make it look like you're doing clinton but you're actually doing fdr yeah 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 i don't think anyone's sussed that out yet <laughs> uh, which ironically we, we've talked about this before hopefully we don't lose a bunch of viewers real quick but i i do actually think um that i mean if the republicans ever got smart that is really what they should do right i mean out of one side of their mouth they should talk about you know we're going to build america to be number one again we're going to have the tallest building we're going to have super highways you know self-driving lanes uh, for cars, all that sort of stuff. And out of the other side of their mouth, you know, talk about being fiscally responsible and all that sort of stuff. And I mean, I think, I think right. they could get some momentum out of that, but they're never going to do that. So, and the Democrats are never going <laughs> to grow a spine either and, and, uh, push through yeah. their agenda. So I think we're stuck for a while politically, but, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, if the GOP wanted to do it, I mean, but the same with the same with any, any side of it, if they just wanted to stop being neoliberals, there's, there's ways to do it. Right? Yeah. The, the issue would be about, or the uproar from activists would be about um, uh, sustainability economics. In that case, like, yeah, we can we can pour a lot more concrete to make skys more skyscrapers and so forth, vertical farming and everything. Uh, but uh, then it then it has uh, implications for uh, e ecology and climate change and all that sort of thing. Yeah. But the GFP can do that because they don't believe in climate change. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. They could actually be wildly popular for a while if they wanted to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it could, it could, it could be pulled off. Um, WWE fan, you had said in 2013, didn't the Republicans do something like that? I think you're right. I mean, I think it was. Let me pull up the chart here. Uh, that would have been an interesting reaction function to look at, actually, Bailey. Was it was it was it twenty? Because because what happens is you think you think well if the markets the markets in quotes feel that uh, having a debt ceiling and constraining the government is really good for business, uh, then they're going to react positively. But then, as Warren points out, anyone who gets paid to be right will say uh, increasing the government deficit adds to GDP. So they're going to have the exact opposite reaction function. So, wait, <laughs> you I'm just sorry. wait out. You, oh, you yeah. wait out the yeah. You wait out the um, short term like crazy reaction. Like oh, you know this is going to be good if we cut cut the deficit and and cut back the debt. And then and then you you know uh, apply what you expect, but later or I guess you do some of that um, futures stuff. I th I think so that it's hard to say. Yeah, I'll just just it's hard to say what the reaction function would have been if you look at the data because there's there's a short term reaction and then there's a longer term, right? 
I think there would be cons- I think there would be consensus. So I, I remember a 2001 I, or 2011, the debt ceiling crisis, and then I think this is the 13 one that you were talking about. I, I uh, WWE fan. I think the consensus would be that um, that no matter what, there is a need for what we'll call it the short term liquidity that when the Fed spends that they offer the banking system. I think that is, is kind of universally understood, uh, at least in the short run, that the Fed, the Treasury, and the banking system and the overnight lending system rely heavily on a steady stream of, of issuance of new bonds or of new bills in short term. Right short-term debt. So I think when you see a sudden contraction in markets heading into a debt ceiling crisis, that really is the immediate reason why. And then I think as, yeah. as you would say, if investors think like, hey, this is actually gonna help the market out long run, right? Um, because there'll be we're a gonna, little rally. Yeah, there will be yeah. a rally and then, you know, <laughs> reality, the reality hits. Your reality right? hits, then, yeah. Yeah, that as it, it turns down. That as it turns out, no one has money now. <laughs> That's why you get a bit of a sawtooth function because it's it's yeah. always going up and down against people's expectations. Exactly, exactly. You know, if everyone understood MMT and invested and traded it uh, on that basis, uh, you get a get rid of a lot of the noise because it's a uh, it's a competing system. It's got a you know, it's a pendulum that wants to swing with certain frequency, but the um, People who don't understand the system are always pushing in the opposite direction. And then they get surprised. And so then they kind of retreat. But then they realize, oh, the government is serious about cutting the deficit. So then they go bullish again, but then they have to retreat. Yep. yep. So when you when you have a system like that, that that people don't understand, by gosh, me and my the physics analogy is getting out of control here, man. <laughs> but I'll explain this later. I'll explain Maybe this it later. was all physics all yeah. along. I know, I know you're going to say, don't say <laughs> that, but. Um, maybe it <laughs> yeah, was so, the entire time. So the pendulum, you, pendulum wants to swing in a certain way at a natural frequency. If, if people keep keep pushing opposite to the uh, natural, uh, natural Hame- dynamics. Hamel, I wanted to jump back. You had wondered if uh, some Republicans might hold up the the debt ceiling stuff. Yeah, I, I mean that, that seems very reasonable. I mean, I think a lot of the Republicans right now um, see an opportunity to yeah. uh, to be opportunists here. So that wouldn't surprise me. At all. Um, let's see. All right. We let's can't stop re- greasing the military wheels, though, <laughs> with Ukraine. Oh, yeah. I mean, then that, that's, yeah. That's one I mean, big, big injection that you're yeah, always going to have. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. Oh, yeah. They'll always get the, the, the military spending to come through just, just in time. Um, although in theory, I mean, I think if the debt ceiling doesn't get passed, the, the treasury and the fed are just not allowed to operate in, in the, the function that they do. So we'll see. That's still, uh, I mean, again, it, it's a headline that's hitting quite often. So I wanted to at least discuss what's happening down the line there. So if it sort of freezes bond issues though, so what happened, you know, everyone should remember the, the lesson from Australia when they decided they just, yeah, stop issuing bonds. And then, um, you know, then, and then the, it was the markets, the private markets that just cried endlessly, like, oh, give us our basic income. <laughs> what, they forced is, the government yeah. to go back to re- reissuing yep. debt. Yep. Yep. So it's always worth remembering that is that the, no matter how bad their political, uh, you know, clog, clog up gets, it's always. The, the, you know, the politicians will listen to Wall Street and Wall Street will start crying about the need for more bonds. And, exactly. And then then they'll come. Exactly. They'll eventually come. Uh, exactly. Not only do they do they appreciate the free income, but also the, the regulatory constraints for banks to increase their balance sheet really rest on the need for collateral and the most pristine collateral and, and kind of banking right. parlance is... Um, is the short term yeah. is short term government debt so um yeah. there is that aspect to it uh let's see if you are rolling in make sure you hit that like button get subscribed all that good stuff if you're stumbling across th- these live streams for the first time get subscribed hit the notification bell so you won't miss anything going forward uh say hi if you're in the chat questions if you uh yeah if you have any as we uh, as we keep going on like i said we have some topics we can definitely uh definitely 
shift to if, uh, yeah, if there's interest or if we just decide that's what we want to talk about. So, um, or if there's anything you want us to talk about, let us know as well. Yeah. I, I reckon Josh might be right there. I mean, it's a good question. It'll be, it'd be hard to just look at data and see, and see the difference. But I think, I imagine there will be a difference this time around with more investors aware of MMT for sure. Um, you know, investors who want to get things right, they don't, they don't care about these memes going around with tombstones, death of MMT, <laughs> 2012 yeah. to 2022, yeah. which is hilarious. They, they just go, oh, well, you know, pragmatically, I want to, I want to make money. So yep. I'll, um, I, that, that, they'll figure things out, the, the smarter ones anyway. But I don't know what happens in that whole ecosystem. It's like Douglas said, it's a, it's a bit of an incestuous thing because the financial press write things up. They ask, you know, the investors in the Wall Street, uh, you know, what's going to happen. And then, uh, but the investors in Wall Street, uh, to, to figure out what's going to happen, they ask the journalist. It's just, it's just a, you know, endless, uh, it's just an incestuous cycle. <laughs> so, yep. Yeah. Agent based dynamics. Yep. Yep. Um, that'll be my theme for today <laughs> predator prey sort of stuff um i don't know who the predator is and who the prey is but uh, i would imagine they're eating each other at some point yeah. uh, hi robin brooks yeah I, th I think i saw one of his yeah douglas had an inter interesting story about that too yeah we got a we got a tombstone uh meme from someone so i, I don't i don't know who robin brooks is should I should I know Robin Brooks? <laughs> this is bad that I don't know who they are. I'm looking them up right now. Uh, That's not bad. Okay. Okay. Friends <laughs> of academia or whatever. Okay. Okay. <laughs> inside inside a Neela rule stuff. Um, chief economist at IIF. Look at his Twitter. Yeah, I mean, he's bald with glasses. I don't. That says it all, right? <laughs> Balding with glasses. Uh, I did just look up his Twitter. <laughs> there's, there's an awesome Robin Brooks, who's an ex All Black rugby player. Okay, I, I, I tend to listen to him on uh, his take more than uh, the other guy. <laughs> uh, I'll give him a I'll give him a look after the live stream. <laughs> um, okay, I want to share some data, uh, just some things. Okay, right. you, you know we we continue to build up, and I think we're getting pretty close to just firing away at uh, what we're calling Dugbot. I mean, this is our, our, our artificial neural network or, or deep learning idea. Um, we're coming up with different features. And one of the things that I've, I'm just trying to get a good grasp on, I mean, I think I intuitively know what's happening, but I really wanted some good data for this. And that really is this whole idea of inflation, the Fed trying to fight inflation with their quote unquote tools. Um, what leads inflation what causes and I, I mean i use that in in the uh most non-statistical way possible but you know what what causes inflation um and one thought that I've, I've had for some time is to look at uh look at the taxes that are received on the daily treasury statement particularly the fica taxes and, and the employment taxes uh that are received and see if there's you know, some correlation there um, with uh, whether that be inflation or rates or at least market expectation of rates. And, um, and I was even possibly thinking uh, just as maybe a, a way to get in front of jobs data or something like that. And so I, I pieced some things together and I found some really darn interesting things that are, are probably just worth sharing. Um, so hopefully I've, I've uh, set up the hype train. Kind of interesting here. This is, this is great having someone who, who likes looking at num at the charts. Um, here it is. I can't tell you how, how cool it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the best part is it passes the interocular test uh, ten out of ten times. So <laughs> no no need for no need for any rigorous machine learning. Um, yeah. I just like it. <laughs> I just want to say I just want to say I just want to butt in here for the number files here. It's like the way Douglas did this is not the way I would have done it. So I would have. I would have just plotted that this is for the, um, what was it? What, what's pulled up right now was treasury. Was, yeah. The daily oh, treasury the statement, the, the employment. Yeah. The employment tax. Yeah. yeah tax. Yeah. Or oh, the tax with the tax. Yeah. I, I would have just plotted the, um, 
differential uh, change, so, so the rate of change that the techs take day to day. Whereas, well, see, what Douglas does is he does this thing where he <laughs> he adds on the historical accumulated entire tax for all time. And so then he gets this really interesting and shape out of it because you see those small, those little small fluctuations, the really small ones on the, is it the blue? Yeah, mm -hmm. the blue curve. Mm -hmm. Right. If I plot them my way, that they just become spikes, massive spikes. And I just get a whole lot, just a fluctuation like white noise. And then every so often a big spike when there's a big tax uh, take or um, whatever. So, yeah. So, so when you add on the historically accumulated tax and then look at the fluctuations about that day to day, so the denominator changes, you see this, this um, trend line where there's little fluctuations on these big, the, you see the big cycles, which, you know, sort of dropping down from 2008 to, what is it, 2010 or something like that. Yeah, dip, yeah, dip, yeah. And it goes up and then down. So there's, um, that's a really good way of looking at the data, which I would have never done, you see, because I would I just wouldn't have thought to do that. Um, so this, this is the advantage of being on Douglas's stream here, guys. <laughs> just, yeah, just saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this is why you should subscribe, turn the notification bell on, hit like. Um you know, so so one of the things, and, and I did actually, uh, I did go the route that Bijou originally said, and it was just too noisy of data um, to, to really figure out. And and that is eventually, like he was saying, I, what I was, what I realized that what I really needed to do was build a, a, a national debt in reverse of taxes, right? So how much, how much tax has, has been accumulated so I can get our acceleration function. If you remember from a live stream or two ago, we talked about the acceleration trying to get that acceleration function. And then that is really kind of the determining factor of, of, of the force that's moving, you know, whatever it is that we're trying to figure out financial, uh, indicator, um, you know, what's actually moving that. And so, you know, we came up with this, I've got another chart that goes kind of a little bit closer to, to the way that, uh, you would have pieced it together as well, but it's, it's a detector of the driving force. It's not the yeah, driving force thank itself. you. Yeah. A detector. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Ultimately, we don't know what the full driving source is, but um, our driving force is. Uh, either way, I mean, I mean, what you're seeing here is, and again, this is this is on the daily treasury statement. You can calculate this yourself. Um, I forget. I think I calculated. I forget the exact number. It was like nine trillion. I don't know what it was. Nine trillion. I don't know how many total taxes I came up with. Um, is is the starting point uh, to to then accumulate on top of, um, but what you definitely see is this kind of lag, <laughs> uh, or this early indicator of where the ten year yield is going to head, uh, based on the employment data. And then the idea is, or based on the uh, the employment taxes, the idea is if um, if the government is receiving more taxes, that means we're seeing employment push higher, right? Or we're seeing wages push higher, or we're seeing a combination of both push higher, right? So I would say tax receipts, employee tax receipts, is a pretty darn good measure of the strength of employment and wages combined. We then take the percent change or the rate of change, as we would call it in finance of that, and then we take one layer lower, which would be, or one layer higher, which would be then the acceleration, that ex the same idea, to come up with this uh, this employment tax accelerator, uh, which then ends up giving us a pretty good kind of six month to a year head start on where rates are going to be headed. And how I would e effectively in interpret this then is that, okay, we're seeing the initial surge, kind of the, we'll call it the inflationary uh, surge and uh, kind of defined or more of a, po a popular definition of, of inflation, the more inflationary surge we saw after um, after the kind of shakeout, the post-COVID shakeout, we saw the strong surge there. And now we're starting to see over the last six months or so that come down. Of course, for whatever reason, there seems to be this, this lag for the market to realize this. Uh, but I think the very first indicator that we would expect to see that the kind of inflationary pressure is starting to come off is that the acceleration of uh, of the rate of change of employment taxes, FICA taxes that are calculated in the daily treasury statement are starting to uh, are starting is, is starting to come down, and so I think um, I think we might be onto something here, and this will also be helpful too because in our learning model this will be a good addition a good feature to add because this will give us this will allow the model to learn where rates are headed and that's really i think 
you know, kind of what I want out of this is just a good predictor of uh, of where rates are headed. Obviously, you can invest on that alone, uh, but if we know where rates are headed, that will help uh, the learning model better determine kind of the proper pricing of market assets based on uh, based on the various valuation models, discounted cash flow, net present value, that sort of thing. Um, so, uh, you, you know, there's that component of it. Um, so that was kind of the, the purpose of this, but yeah. I think it's kind of cool. I think correlation here is is pretty strong. And um, the final piece I'll say about this is that you know in, in inflation um, does eat away at kind of the the the, the effectiveness of government spending. I mean, if inflation were a hundred percent every year, if if the government just continued to spend at the at a consistent rate, that hundred percent inflation is going to uh, what have the value of every dollar. Um, uh, as the cycle pushes on or whatever the math would work out to be. So um, inflation eats away at the potency of fiscal flows. That's the important part um, that, that matters. And we really need to see and it. And I, and I think, I mean, it's a good indicator that inflation is going to start to come down in 2023. I mean, we'll start to see uh, legitimate, uh, legitimate slow on inflation, at least based on this model. And I think a lot of other things are starting to point that way. And certainly the Fed pays very close attention to wages and employment. And so I think we're seeing an, an early indicator at that. I don't know if you want to jump in, uh, yeah. Bijou and add. Uh, yeah, that's good. Well, yeah, uh, maybe a couple of things is that regardless of where inflation eats away at the um, residual, uh, the, at the government's residual, the, you know, the deficit, uh, it, it also is, is like a tax, right? It, it actually keeps demand for the currency going. So it just allows the government to invest more. So if you understand that it's not the government deficit causing the inflation, um, if there is inflation, it just, this is this is like a total Warren Mosler. Uh, take, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I agree yeah. with I agree with yeah. inflation hook yeah it, it just allows the government to spend a hell of a lot more so you got to look at what the real outcome of that spending is and, and as long as it's not on you know boondoggles and junkets and things but it's on actual investment in real goods that people need then the government can can say oh great the government should be saying great there's inflation however it's caused and then they should do things like regulate to stop price gouging and all the egregious activity but then they should just say to themselves, well, it just allows us to spend more because now there's more demand for the currency that's going in. And uh, worry about the exchange rate, you know, later. Worry about the whole idea of a glo having having the global reserve currency later. That's a, that's a separate sort of issue. Mm -hmm. Interesting that uh, Randy Ray did a webinar on that just the other day that Douglas and I caught the tail end of. But um, but I don't <laughs> I don't want to trigger too many right wingers here with the inflation hawkery <laughs> yeah i mean <laughs> this is <laughs> it's like they did deficit deficit hooks but i'm an inflation hook so it's mostly but yeah but, I, I, but the thing is about the thing is interesting that what douglas just found there is that um it really it really does to me play out show, show you in, in, in an interesting way the tax drives money story yeah yeah if you had any yeah, doubt about it just go back and look at that data and you know, come back in ten years' time if 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 the, everything's changed and we and this was just a fluke, yep, yep, a <laughs> chance correlation, then you can you know then you can uh, dunk on us then. But well, the good news is if you want to do that, I've actually pulled up the federal government current tax receipts. Now, unfortunately, this data is quarterly, um, which is why I wanted to go off the tra uh, daily treasury statement. Which Ty, you you could probably find. The Canadian government um, quarterly data quite easily in, C, uh, in CPI and obviously rates. Um, uh, I mean, I've never looked into it, uh, despite being a very close neighbor of Canada. Um, uh, let's see, but I, I mean, I, this, this correlation goes back to the 1980s, um, where, where you see, yeah, where you see this kind of play out, where federal government receipts push up. I mean, it's a bit spurious at times. And obviously, you know, before we'd stick this into anything terribly meaningful, uh, in terms of a model, you know, we'd want to do a little bit more rigor on it and, and definitely post kind of that 1980, or even, even as we head into the uh, great financial crisis, it seems to pick up a little bit of strength and correlation, but nevertheless, um, there seems to be a bit of a, a connection here. So again, I, I pulled up CPI here and the, the idea with the adding CPI on top of, where rates are at. Cause again, I would understand rates to be 
the guess of where the market thinks the Fed is heading, which is really a kind of a messed up cycle, right? Because they're guessing mm -hmm. what the monopoly price setter is going to do, but the monopoly price <laughs> setter doesn't know that it's the monopoly price setter. <laughs> if you say guess in psychology, I, I, I'm a god agent based. Man. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, you have that, but no, then no, I, hopefully a neural net will work a, work out a little bit on this because it's just a whole lot of confounding factors. When, when you've got an exogenous money system and an endogenous money system pushing and pulling, yeah, then uh, then you don't expect to see correlation here perfect. But, but what what mutual information there is between the two time series here, I, I think is telling a tax drive money story. Yeah. I agree. I agree. I I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually, some of these, uh, you know, yeah, some of these time series start to tell a, a story that I, I don't yeah. think, I mean, I think that's one of the things that when you first watch, you know, the Steve Keen lectures and, and whatnot, and it's one of the things you, uh, you immediately see is it's like they, there wouldn't be, um, neo, neoclassical types just wouldn't even expect these correlations to even look for these correlations. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They I, just I, say it's all spurious. Yeah. 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 And, and yet they, they, con they constantly show up every time you look for them where you would expect to see them. I don't know. Um, so obviously well, they, the DHB flow just on models. Maybe they have a, you know, EP cycle for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. FP cycles. I mean, that's, that's what they have to go into, right? Is... Uh, we've got the EP cycle for that one. <laughs> yeah. 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 If, uh, if Mars only circles a few times around earth, well, yeah. it circles around the yeah. sun and clearly, yeah, then clearly we're onto something, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, Ty, if you want to, man, I mean, if, if, if you need, uh, yeah, feel free to reach out on Twitter or something too. If, if you know, you're, yeah, you need any help with what data I'm using or, or whatnot, I'd be happy to, happy to share that. Um, so those are my thoughts. I think there's something there. Um, again, you know, the big idea too, if, you know, I'm, I, I mean, it's, it's no secret. I'm in, I'm in this, um, yeah, sunspots, um, I mean, I'm in this really uh, not only to understand MMT to understand how, how the how the world works, but also to to build build and train ultimately this, this model to understand how, how financial models work. And and the more we can get ahead of what it is that the markets are going to see, the the better uh, the better we're going to be for for our, our our larger models to really understand what the hell's going on. So <laughs> spots on some spots. Yeah. Um. Let's see. I think that is kind of the crux of what it is that I wanted to start out with tonight. So um, good. Um, that was a good recap. Thank you for that. I know Bijou has some ideas, and you know, if, if you're in the chat, again, hit that like button. Um, and send some yeah, well, questions. I had some talking. Too. Yeah, send some questions. I had some talking points, but I I, I have a great time uh, engaging with the chat. I can say I, I sort of feel like I'm, I'm just part of the chat here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because so one of the things it wasn't it wasn't on the top of our list of list of talking points today, but but when uh, Josh says monopolist, not knowing that the monopolist is one of the saddest realities of the world, <laughs> it's also it also feeds into the, the agent based dynamics. So this whole thing that Douglas has been talking about with the um, the yeah the the feedback effects. <clears throat> so I'll, t I'll tell you what Doug Douglas didn't didn't wasn't aware of the uh, where where a lot of the thinking in the um, complex systems community came from about this, but it came from Santa Fe Institute uh, economists and physicists and biologists. <clears throat> They're in Albuquerque, New Mexico, right? And they want to go to this amazing Mexican food bar with a great nightlife called the Al Farol Al Farol Bar. So they invent this problem where it's like, do you decide to go to the El Farol bar because there's a great band on the night and, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be buzzing? Because if you go, then other people are going to go and it's going to suck because it's, it's the waiting times are going to be huge. There's going to be a line. You might, you might not even get in. So they wondered if there's a solution to this using, you know, economics, right? And they realized pretty quickly that there wasn't a solution. It was not a, not a problem you could solve. And, uh, and they really, you know, partly because it's a feedback system, right? But the way to do it is to just use agent based modeling. <laughs> so, you, so you can do that. It doesn't, it doesn't really help you tell you, tell, help tell you whether you go to the bar or not. It just gives you some sort of, uh, like a roll of the dice thing. 
like you weight the dice, roll it, and then just decide whether to go to the bar or not. But the, the agent-based modeling can tell you, uh, you know, what to do with your roll of the dice. You so you just have a probability distribution for it. And that's the sort of best case scenario. There's no no actual way of telling uh, analytically whether you're going to have to wait in line for a long time to get your food and so forth. <laughs> so I mean, we're discussing about this. Douglas hadn't heard of that before, but he immediately realized, you know, that, that that's the way a lot of the financial markets work yep. is that they're yep. talking to each other and it just goes around in a circle jerk. And that's like, oh, yeah, out of that comes sort of some investment decisions and so forth. And it's only the more sagacious people who later apply a trend to this that will, you know, follow some sort of rationality that they realize when the government deficit increases, uh, there's going to be growth. So, so that led us to thinking about, um, yeah. So, what is what is the actual real effect? It's not just the sad psychology, but what is the real effect in the economy when you have people who are running an MFT system who don't know they're running an yeah. MFT system? Yeah, currency monopolists who don't know that they're currency monopolists. So, okay. So here it is. So initially, I thought, well, actually, you know, it's going to look a lot like a um constrained system is going to because you got the debt ceiling everything it's going to look a lot like mmt is false because the people running the system don't understand it and then douglas said no nah, he pushed back he said right well, you know it's still an mmt system so you're going to have it's going to still have to look mmt right uh ultimately some in some way it's going to force you because of the constraints and so we there was this interesting sort of question and it and it's important for Dugbot and any work that anyone does, like what Ty is doing, what Steve King's doing, is is you want to try to maybe understand a little bit of that and understand, yeah, or the impact of Josh's question there. Like if, if you've got idiots in charge, you don't know they're running an MMT system. The, the weird thing is the MMT, mon the monetary operations are robust. So the idiots in charge don't have any way of really... Um, breaking the system it still just runs as as it as it runs because they don't really even know how to change it probably uh, they don't know how to not become a currency monopolist put to put it that way <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> but but then they're gonna make uh gonna make some interesting and strange decisions if from the perspective of a mm mmt here it's gonna look uh, so so anyway this was something that we i don't think we resolved did we douglas but but you you had some views on that maybe in terms of, uh, yeah, I mean, what, what of the, whether, yeah. whether it's going to um, play out like MMT says, what, one of the things would, would sort of predict. One of the things is worth uh, worth noting, like uh, it's inescapable that the market just can't escape is the fact that government spending ends up in the private sector. Like that's uh, you can't escape it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I mean, <laughs> you're you're not not going to take the money, um, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. I, I, obviously, the the two biggest recipients are. Social Security recipients and healthcare, Med Medicaid, Medicare, and then um, defense contractors, right? I mean, so so in that order, um, and th that becomes. Uh, I mean, I think Warren Mosler puts it this way. I mean, it becomes the the capitalization of the private sector, right? Uh, and so, no no matter what, whether you save or spend it, if you save it, then the next person has the decision to save or spend it. But eventually, that money ends up in in a bank somewhere um capitalizing some bank and so that that aspect of it is impossible to escape um yeah. and any you know and, and as the money circulates to to kind of fuel the economy um the money will always find the path away from taxes right and so you will always find as long as there's a 401k system there's going to be an incentive to um you know to put your savings into whatever's not going to get taxed right <laughs> yeah. um so you stack all that up and that just becomes inescapable and which is why this will be a twitter post i'm putting together soon uh i'll start getting more active on twitter again here but if you average out the average return of the s p 500 uh from i think i calculated it back to like 1946 Six forty nine, somewhere around there. It's like eight and a half percent. Um, I, I bet every one of you watching could also guess what the average <laughs> deficit was during that same time frame. 
Um, it was eight and a half percent. So I, 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 I mean, it's yeah, that <laughs> there's no escaping it. That that's how the no stock. Escaping. I mean, that's how the stock market grows. Obviously, yeah. the correlation is not one to one. Obviously, there's a lot that happens in between. Uh, but given enough yeah. time, it is an MMT system, right. and there's no way there's no way around it. So that's the thing. So where you where you look for um, where do you where you look to see where the, the currency monopolists not knowing them and not knowing that they are the monopolists? We I think you see that effect is in uh, domestic distribution. So that's when you see uh, extremes of wealth and poverty. Uh, you know, yeah. massive mansions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a lot of a lot of building construction going into McMansions and that sort of thing, uh, and not enough basic housing. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah, you see, you see it, and you see it in distribution. So you don't see it in the, necessarily in the macro data, as Douglas said. In the macro data, it always looks kind of healthy if there's a government yeah, deficit. yeah, yeah. So it's so healthy for investors and the upper class, and uh, yeah, it kind of sucks for a lot of other, a whole lot of other people. Which so, is just some life advice. <laughs> stay, I mean, stay away, uh -huh. stay away from debt and buy assets. I mean, I, I you know, right. I mean, that, that is uh, certainly. That is certainly some life advice um, because the system is set up to screw those in debt and benefit yeah. those who buy assets. And I'm not telling you to to go get into some big speculation thing, but well, yeah, um, you certain, don't starve yourself just in order to save yeah. to get to yeah, buy to, those assets. To buy assets, I mean, some but, people can't yeah. help it. But. Yeah, um, yeah. Anyway, yeah, I'll, I'll digress a, with the life get a, advice. Get a but, job if you can, and then mm -hmm. yeah. Do your best to save and uh, don't don't go into debt too much if you can avoid it. But as we were talking about, I, I mean, what, you know, just I mean, kind of the insidious nature of of the 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 world we live in right now. Um, in order to you know, quote unquote, get ahead or even even get a middle class lifestyle, there are these um, repellers and attractors that we've talked about yeah. in the past yeah. and. Uh, you know, to ha to have at least to give your your kids a slightly better life than you did, or whatever. You know, I mean, I'm not talking about living extravagantly here. Um, you have to take on a lot of debt, and that's I mean, that's kind of the sad part is there's no escaping the massive yeah. the massive debt load that people have to take on to even get a chance to get a middle class lifestyle or you know a upper middle class lifestyle. And yet, the vast majority of those people, oh, just yeah. by by the way the distribution by the way the distribution works. Yeah, I mean, you just yeah. have to go into debt whenever you get laid off work. Yep, it's it's a hell of a, it's an effort to find a find a job. Uh, you know, you're having to uh, go into use your credit card just to you know do things to get a good job or to, to apply for jobs. And um, if there's no job guarantee, you know that's a that's a situation. Yep. Uh, so yeah, it's really tough. So yeah, I mean, it's just really bad. You can't just say, "Oh, go get a job and then do your best to save." <laughs> it's like uh, through no fault of their own, there's a huge number of people who uh, can't get jobs. Yep, yep. Uh, it's, it's totally no no need for that at all. Yep. Um, and in the U.S., you start off fifty thousand dollars behind the eight ball right out of the gate. So good, you know, good luck to What's you. That, that college or something? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, it's a bad system, uh, obviously. But, uh, <laughs> but the life it, advice is, is, yeah, point well taken. I guess do, do your do your best to just realize that if you're gonna if you're gonna play that game, what the uh, what the outcome it's a, it's is. A, it's, a, it's a dog and bone story. Good one. Yeah, I, to, I, <laughs> I even heard this. I even heard this. Go, yeah, tell me the story. Oh no! Just if you um, if you're a oh yeah monopoly okay, okay yes. if you're a monopoly issuer of bones, you know. And uh, you've got a um, hundred dogs, and you, you know you want them to be productive, right? So you want them to get go to work as bone finders because that'll generate some growth, whatever you know. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Imagine. So you send out ninety bones, and they all go fetch their bones, do the work, come back. You know, ten dogs come home boneless. That's if each can only hold one in their mouth at a time, right? Yep. So, so. <laughs> Why are you doing that, right? Why are you punishing those 10 dogs? Um, but then you say, okay, no problem. We just train them, right? You use a neoliberal. Go to school, <laughs> guys. Go to school. Yeah, yeah. Become upskilled. This is the whole upskilling movement. Yeah. And I get this in venture philanthropy circles all yeah. the time. And I'm just like going, you guys, what? You have no idea. 
So you upskill these 10 dogs, they repeat the experiment, send out all 100 dogs, but only give them 90 bones, and a different 10 dogs come home yeah. boneless. Yep. yep. Different 10 dogs. And you just re retrain those. So what happens when you retrain those 10 dogs? They're going to become expert bone finders. So it's going to get vicious. This bone finding, if they're going to start scratching and clawing at each other and eat, you know, biting each other to get those bones because now they're pretty, they're all good experts, right? So it just never ends. It's a vicious thing. So the thing is, though, you had like endless amount of bones to supply because you just type it on a spreadsheet. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Why, why are you doing this to these poor, poor dogs? And, um, a lot of sensitive lefties don't like that story because they don't like thinking of humans as dogs. But, um, you know, get over it, guys. It's only a, <laughs> it's only a parable. <laughs> and, in fact, we are doing this to our people and uh, we are allowing long-term unemployed people to go um, without food and shelter. And so it's just a terrible, miserable story that doesn't exist, that doesn't need to happen. Yeah. And the thing is, thing is, this is why you read the textbooks and all the sort of, uh, discourse over economics, how it's the dismal science. Well, you guys, you know, you're making it dis dismal. Economics, if you understand the monetary system, is um, um, an amazing system. of uh, It tells you, well, at least MMT does, it gives you a way to have fair distribution and policies that incorporate actual spiritual justice, not some sort of uh, you know, algorithm version of it where you kind of have some rich get richer story. So yeah, that's the dog and bud story. Nice. Nice. I it's like a good it. one to it's a good one to have for um uh your family and friends, which is a, one of the discussions topics yeah. that we had. Yeah. Um I'm trying to think of with that story kind of a good uh like a, a steel man the other side argument, right? Um, it would but, be useful to steal man the other side to, so that we know how to unsteal it or melt yeah, the steel. Because I'm, I mean, I'm thinking that like uh, you know, something would be that you need the the competitive nature to find the bones to really create, you know, the 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 best the best way to keep finding bones. But I think the point is not that the bones themselves have any value per se. Right. It's uh, the activity that they have yeah. to do to get the bones. So you make them run over some hoops and jump through gates. And that that produces apples and oranges and things and housing. Yeah, that's yeah. a full story. Yeah, <laughs> you gotta appreciate it. it's not. Yeah, when you when you give people these kind of allegorical, metaphorical stories that just just um, got to connect. If the they're analogy. gonna nitpick, yeah. nitpick at that sort of level, you sort of have to worry about their sanity. Yeah, yeah. Maybe give them the um, just give them the uh, Pompeii story. I think that's always a good one. It's pretty hard to weasel out of that story. But didn't the... I mean, uh... I did ask Warren one time personally, you know, what do you think is one of the best approaches? What about the Pompeii story? And he said, yeah, that's that's a good one to start with. But didn't the, didn't his uh, didn't his tour guide weasel out of it, though? <laughs> his <laughs> tour guide put up, said, no, 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 no. But I think that's progress. No, I know. I'm <laughs> joking. I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if I tracked your, uh, Josh has a comment here about, um, about your back and forth on Twitter about misunderstanding the job guarantee. Yeah. Um, Twitter. No, that was just in the Jacobin Matt Brunig writing. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. I guess I'm, I'm reading Twitter yeah. in there. Yeah. Well, people yeah. just want to see it as, as work fair or work for the doll. Which is okay. just terribly disappointing. Have they read anything that Bill Mitchell writes? I mean, Bill Mitchell is the uh, quintessential like MMT socialist kind of go-to guy. So they only have to read Bill Mitchell, and Bill Mitchell writes for Jacobin. So he could have just went went, went down the office and uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, the, the online office. Yeah. What was the office, but yeah, it shows you that Jacobin writers don't read their their other colleagues' work. What was the <laughs> counterpoint? I, I guess can, can you flesh out the 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 point that Matt Brun, Brunig 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 had? Um, okay, so I don't know. Maybe he's more of a libertarian socialist. Okay, but um, I don't really know exactly. 
but the idea is just that oh you know so you're relying on government for the job so government gets to determine the job and so uh, uh, you know the okay. government government is is using i don't know if you even know if he understands tax drives money because he's more of a tax funds the government kind yep. of guy yeah so it's a bit screwed up in many ways but i think his his basic idea is that it is that neoliberals would make it work for the doll so he doesn't understand that anyone with the MET brain who's still a neoliberal by that time, oh, you know, yeah. something wrong with him. Yeah, something wrong with that kind of. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. If you, if you actually really want people to uh, work punitively in order to get your currency, rather than giving them a choice of job to do for their local community, their choice. So the job guarantee is is your claim on your government. It's not the government's claim on you. So Brunig's a UBI enthusiast because. He doesn't understand. He doesn't understand money. So for MET, it's exactly the reverse. UBI is 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 a free is your claim on someone else's yep. labor. Yeah. Whereas the job guarantee is your claim on the government. And since the government is not not funded in terms of its ability to spend by taxpayers, uh, the government can always offer you a job because that is the purpose of the tax is to create unemployment. And then the government's role is to then immediately extinguish all of the unemployment that it's tax created. So you don't, uh, so if you're still going <laughs> to use the residual level of people who cannot find work in the private sector or for government or for the public se- or, or for the government hiring uh, desires, and you want to treat these residual unemployed people uh, like scum and let's get them to do all the dirty work for you. Well, then you're still a neoliberal. You haven't really, you haven't really crossed over the, you know, into, yeah. the, into yeah. the light side into MMT territory yet, because you're still using it punitively instead of as a, a means to uplift people. Plus, training should be. I mean, Pavlina Chernova talks about this, that, you know, and Mott Warren, of course, is actually even better because uh if you can't do anything else with the job guarantee at least give people an option to uh train up and, and upskill themselves but this time you're giving them you it's treating it treating training as a job but this is something i always tell my daughters is that you know going to university and getting education it's actually a hard job to do it's it requires some effort actually yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so why not why not get paid for it cuz it is a job and it is going to benefit society later on yeah. So instead of having to pay for your university fees, which incentivizes you just to cut corners and get and get the degree with as minimal work as possible, why not just get paid to keep going at it for as long as you need to get the qualification, and then you become a useful person yeah, it's, in it's society because yeah, you haven't had yeah. the pressure to just get the degree or the grade. Yeah. Instead, you're focusing on learning, and so I think people have the monetary incentive all the way wrong around it, way the wrong way around in education. But it's like that, I think, with the job guarantee. So it always tra- training should always be an option, and it's only work fair in that case if the government tells you what you have to do, what skills you have to retrain, and you know, coding <laughs> is the usual. Yeah. One, right? Yeah. So instead, why not be, get trained to be a poet or an artist or whatever, whatever you want to do, as long as it's not like how to build nuclear weapons or, or become an arsonist, professional <laughs> arsonist. <laughs> then, then you know. Um, so the, the government could have a, a schedule of allowed things that you can do in a job guarantee, but it should be very, very liberal. And so how you actually come around to think that's workfare, just it's like you, you got to not be reading Bill Mitchell, that, that's for sure, who's your colleague on the magazine that you're writing for. What... Um, <laughs> um... What was I going to say? Yeah, is, transition is, job for now. Yeah, is he for a UBI then? Is that what he's arguing? Or did... I think Brunig would be UBI, yeah, UBI. favored okay. more than a job guarantee. Okay, and it's it's the whole anarchist uh, libertarian thing where well, if you give people a UBI, then they can choose their job for real. They can really do anything like e gaming or professional arsonry. Okay. Hold on. Some, some hold, hold on. Hold on a second. <laughs> yeah, hold on. E-gaming is a is a respectable is a respectable. Oh, my brother says that too. Is a Come respectable on. endeavor uh, that should be Come done. On. This should be done every Friday night with your boys. I'll, I'll uh, give you this. I'll give you this. It does. My brother, who's also an e-gamer, 
mm-hmm. not professional. He did tell me that is a massive audience who just like watching people play these e-games. Twitch, baby. So if you oh, call yeah. that if you yeah. call that entertainment industry, yeah, yeah. a la Hollywood movie, that like like it can even be more interesting than a Hollywood movie because you're I don't I don't know I don't yeah. really know how that works. To me, I, I I find it hard to watch cricket and rugby these days, which used to be my favorite sports because I prefer playing them. But um, yeah. Yeah, so if an e-gamer is entertaining people, oh yeah, yeah, I, I actually wouldn't mind that being uh, a paid-for job, like a, a <laughs> bit of the job guarantee. Yeah, like, you yeah, know, yeah, maybe that's yeah. that's one of the ones where you could say not everyone can be an e-gamer, but we'll have our community can support one or two e-games <laughs> and job Good. guarantee, and you know, and the community can community can decide which ones are the more popular and uh, they're entertainers, and so all the all the rich assholes are really uh, enjoying life and just like to sit back drinking a beer, watching an e-game a game because they don't have to work for anything. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I'm, yeah. you're going to, you're going to puke. When the robots are doing everything. You're going to puke when I tell you how much some of these e-gamers actually make. Well, no, my brother told me it's, they yeah, play. Quite it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's yeah. quite amazing. Yes. Well, that's why maybe it shouldn't be on the job guarantee schedule because it's, it's already. Oh, it's a very saturated. Oh yeah. yeah. No, I, every, everyone would do it then at that point. Exactly. Um, I'll digress from one of my more favorite topics and uh, <laughs> move along. Um, in case you're wondering uh, if you do run across this, Valorant and Counter Strike are my uh, my my personal faves. So if you're if you're a fan of either, comment in the section comment section below. Let me know. Uh, let me know your rank as well. Um, let's see. We had a few a uh, few other questions. Uh, Big Dog, would you revisit your beliefs about gold and energy in 2023? Um, last time I talked about gold has been a while. I mean, I, I'm generally suspicious of gold. The reason I, I just don't invest in gold, even though I think, I mean, we could see a bit of a run up here and I'll tell you why I think we can see a run up, um, is whenever there is a sudden constraint in, uh, in the, uh, the, the, the dollar market, uh, global financial system, dollar market, gold is the first thing to go and you can see gold drop 10% overnight. Um, and it is just constraints in, in the in the overseas dollar funding market are just hard to see coming. Um, there there is it is it is usually the canary in the coal mine. Um, yeah, CS and Rocket League. Okay, Hamel. Hamel's a good guy. Um, <laughs> CS CS one point six. Do you go that far back? I mean, if you want to watch some entertainment, me and my uh, nearly forty year old buds, uh, we all play. So if you ever run across us playing Counter Strike or Valorant, um, say hi. Um, gold is, yeah, I, I just, I, I think the, the downside risk of gold is, is hard to see coming. Um, but gold does perform best in situations that we're in right now, um, uh, that we're in right now where I, I think, and this is why I think we're about to see the, the a turn of the corner here for the, um, the credit cycle, because when you see the credit cycle start to take off, that is kind of inflationary pressure is like finance would define inflation. And so they're going to see bonds paying less than inflation. And so uh, they think they're better off in gold uh, because in, in their goofy ass world, gold will will remain uh, level over time. And so you'll oftentimes see a demand for gold as the uh, as the credit cycle starts to kick back up again. Again, which by my measure got a little depleted in 2022 energy I if, if you know if you're a patreon sub you'll know this I'm, I'm tempted to go along oil here into the summer months I mean I, I think you can make a pretty darn good argument I, I wish I had stronger models I use uh, what's called a comparative inventory model to give me a pretty good price I've talked about it in prior live streams um, but I I, I, I would uh, yeah, I, I think oil is underpriced as it is right now based on this comparative inventory model that I have. And I really think a lot of that has to do with uh, what seems to be kind of a quid pro quo between the Biden administration and the Saudis. And, you know, Bijou, if you want to jump in here, too, and kind of explain that whole wow. dynamic, that would be that would be good. But the, the final point in this is when, when summer here's here's my thought. Summer's going to roll around. Everyone is going to be driving. Well, except for you guys on the other side of the world, you'll be stuck inside. Um but summer's going to be rolling around. You're going to get a lot of uh, you know, car usage, oil usage. I expect inflation to start coming down over the next six months. 
And at that point, the Saudis are going to say, okay, you know, okay, Joe, your inflation's gone. <laughs> the deal's done here. Yeah. We're going to start jacking prices up. And yeah. um, I think that's how it'll play out. So yeah. Um, yeah. They're, they're, well, the cartel OPEC plus you call it these days, certainly they're a, a, a monopoly pretty much. And um, yeah, they'll, they'll set the price. So it's whatever they think they can take and get away with politically. So you, so your comparative inventory model is is good for um, probably a, a kind of baseline or something. I don't know, but but you got to look at the political dynamics and um, how that's going to play out too. So yeah, I think yeah, I think that analysis sounds right. I, I, th- I, I mean, I that's think the, the story. Yeah. You heard it. I, I and I do think too, the minute whatever is suppressing oil prices right now um maybe i can pull this up if you if you give me a second um i'll go ahead and share sure. this um while I, you're doing that yeah yeah go just ahead. want to say ty kings gave a, a little i think a steel man for the other side yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. 90 tokens to find 100 yeah. pounds yeah resource constraints yeah that's, that's probably one thing that they'd come back at us with but uh, they're being excessively pedantic you just just go to pompeii story you know, i'll fix it <laughs> Um, hopefully pulling this up uh, doesn't what else in the chat kill my yeah warren himmel says is about getting people back in the private sector uh yeah true that that's also something you can argue with right wingers uh and then matt brunig didn't understand um warren's take on the job guarantee um uh i'm almost oh hopefully yeah just, okay we're still we're still streaming keep going, right? yeah i i just i just yeah, pressed, yeah i think uh, i think this matt, okay. matt bruning did un, did misunderstand the job guarantee and that um stabilizing features of the job guarantee you, you gotta you gotta wonder if anyone really understands what what the automatic stabilizers really are um and you know if you don't then you're not going to buy the argument for the job guarantee you're just going to dismiss it so I think that's disingenuous or it's not, it's, it's being deliberately ignorant and deliberately ill-informed. I think it'd be, it'd be nice to, um, you know, these, these people like Brunig and there, I, I have to create fictional characters for them in my head to figure out what they, why they're thinking the way they do. Cause all I can do is read their articles and their articles come across as, um, full of a lot of ignorance even though they their heart might be in the right place as far as uh this i'd say you know the anti anti austerity people for sure but but if you don't understand the stabilizing feature of job guarantee yeah 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 you're not gonna you're just gonna try to try to come up with sort of spurious arguments against it just because you don't like it like an atheist would against God, you know, <laughs> or the other way around. Or the other way around, yeah, yeah. Um, I have the comparative inventory okay. model pulled up here. The idea here is pretty simple. Uh, this was put together by a guy named Art Berman. I think he worked with someone else. And uh, generally speaking, most finance types really focus in on the demand side. They think that's what drives um that's what drives price and certainly on the short run if there's demand shock you'll see price drops so so be it but uh according to this model it's really a supply side sort of thing and so what the comparative inventory model does is it takes the five-year historical inventory average at uh, at cushing oklahoma and then overlays on top of that or creates the difference between the current inventory there right so you have this uh, kind of well comparative inventory trend and obviously as you can see there's a pretty good uh, pretty strong negative correlation there and generally speaking when the correlation breaks down for a short period of time that's usually you know something's happening there and we've seen for quite a while now i mean going back to to the, the highs in june and oil to where we're at now um, oil pushed lower with comparative inventory pushing lower which again the model would expect an inverse relationship between the two so oil I think the bigger point would be whatever has suppressed the price of oil, right? Whatever has been, you know, the, would explain whatever is explaining why this model is wrong. And I think the best ex- explanation would be um, 
uh, would be what uh, you know what the Saudis are doing, the the or OPEC. The minute that gives way, there's going to be a ton of pressure, upward pressure on oil. So um, it, it is it is prime to take off here, and uh, yeah. If, if yeah, I, whenever they can, whenever they can uh, raise the price without the Persian, you know, fifth fleet of the USA going up their harbor. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> probably, exactly. Probably will take take the chance. Exactly, and and I also think too that you know I I don't know I don't know how smart their finance guys are who would be part of OPEC or whatever. Yeah, you know who knows what it is they're thinking, but I there I I would imagine that they realize at this point that. The economy is not quite strong enough, given where inflation is already at, to handle super higher oil prices, right? So, in other words, right. if if your expected value, I mean, let, let's just say you know you're kind of playing a a, a gambling game here, right? Your your expected value right now might be to double, you know, to double your money if you were to push your hand right now, right? Or you could wait just six months and maybe have a bet where you could quadruple your money, right? Um, you know, if if there are good enough odds that are not too far out in the future, um, and then you play your hand, then uh, I think you can get away with allowing oil to get up to two hundred and fifty dollars a gallon and still not destabilize. Um, Two hundred fifty dollars a barrel. I'm sorry, and not two hundred fifty dollars a gallon for a gas uh, for some gas for your car. That'd be terrible. Yeah. Uh, two hundred fifty dollars uh, uh, for a barrel, um, and and kind of get away with that longer than I think the the thought would be if if you go ahead and do that now. So there could be there could be a little bit of that at play as well. And then when that finally gives way, yeah, you could see oil take off. Um, yeah, as far as as far as um. Okay, so it's analogy analogous to a poker game, isn't it, Douglas? Which you you're good at. So there's certain cards that you get dealt, but there's also some definite psychology involved. So if you want to take this bet, it's not like a um, completely wild gamble, right? Going oh, go long, going long oil. Yeah. 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 The risk yeah. with the risk, I mean, again, the risk with commodities, though, is always that um, if there is a dollar, and we're we're always on the edge of a dollar shortage. I mean, that is just that is the nature of the global financial system. It has to get solved. No one talks about it. No one has the right framing for it. Um, the world has agreed on a system that is just great for the U.S. and bad for the world. And by that, I don't mean yeah. great for the individuals yeah. in the U.S., but great for <laughs> the political system of the U.S. and terrible for the rest of the world. Yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of yeah, people... It just allows the U.S. to keep importing and... Uh, yep, yeah. yep, yep. Everyone and, else is making... And they're forced to import. I mean, you're forced to export to the U.S. You, it, it would be very difficult to get off of that. Um, yeah, and yeah. And, it, and anyone who thinks that the U.S. is, is going to lose that, that, you know, I don't want to say right, but lose that setup overnight. There's just so much dollar-denominated debt that goes so yeah. long, and it is just the absolute structure of the financial yeah. system. You don't, you don't roll that back overnight. Um, no, no. And then on top of that, the one thing the U.S. does have going for it, that it absolutely has going for it, is as of right now, and this is what, I don't need to get too political, but this is what scared me uh, with the Trump administration and what the U.S. 100% has going for it, is above all else, rule of law and uh, you know judicious proceedings for business contracts and, and, and whatnot have always been paramount against everything else. And I mean, if there's anything that really increases the value of a currency, that's it, right? Uh, in terms of its, yeah. in terms of its position to be used as some sort of, uh, as some sort of reserve asset. Right. Um, yeah. So uh, it, I mean, didn't, didn't Trump almost try to uh, try his best like tariff tariffs on lumber and, you know, you know, we, yeah, <laughs> we'll, yeah. Pay, we'll pay you more for your lumber at Canada. Yeah. Canada. I mean, you know, there's only so much you can do politically with things like that. But, so, so to really unroll the U.S. Um, status is, is uh, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I see it as very institutionally baked in. 
Yeah. So one thing Randy Ray mentioned is China can do it, right? Because they're going to surpass the U.S. pretty soon. Yep. To, I have a retort to this. So yeah, tell Randy Ray so. Yeah, yeah. have a retort. Uh, yeah. Yeah, good to have a retort. Yeah. But he also said that they're not likely to because China doesn't want to issue a, a lot of debt, and they don't they don't want to um, do it that way. Whether they don't understand this potential that they have or not, I'm not sure. But um. But they have they have the they will soon have the capacity to, to do it, and then you'd have maybe a dual uh, reserve currency system with the um, yeah the yuan and and the US dollar both equally uh, in demand. But you have to give people your money <laughs> for them to return and, it back uh, to you, for, yeah, for, to be able to get it back to you to pay. So um, yeah, whether whether China will will want to become a a, a big net importer is is sort of up to them and and i think ray's opinion was that they don't want to and yeah so the us's position is fairly secure for a yeah. long time unless you guys have another civil war which we can yeah, i mean and that's i, I mean i think it? that's uh <laughs> is it uh thomas d you know private debt jubilee something like that to really shake things up enough uh to allow a reset of that system would have to happen um, yeah. Whether it's a civil, <laughs> yeah, an international private debt jubilee. Um, my retort to the China t- taking over that role is, uh, above all else, you need a very stable judicial system to trust oh, yeah, that. Yeah. Okay. Um, to trust that your business contracts will be, you know, fairly fairly viewed by the courts, right? Um, well, I'm not a Chinese expert, but. I wouldn't say the justice system is all that bad, is it? I think they will. I, I, I mean, my, my guess is that the Chinese will ultimately look out for the state, right? I, I mean, if it's a state versus an individual uh-huh. sort of thing, uh, that they're you're shot at at true justice in that situation would be lower than if it's just business versus business. Uh, you mean this? Look after the central committee. Yeah, the China would look after uh, their their yeah. Um, and that you wouldn't necessarily get an impartial justice. Uh, uh, so that, that would do be, we have that in, I don't know if we have that in the USA. Uh, I think it's different, right? I think, I think both countries have rule of law, maybe in a slightly different way though. I don't know. I don't know. Um, it's an interesting pushback. You should ask Randy Ray next time. Yeah. Yeah. It's Cause his wife is Chinese. He travels to China. He, he, he has a, a good understanding as far as anyone, but also there's a few MMTers at um, UMKC or Levy, I think, who are uh, Chinese students. They'd also be good to sound out about that. It's an interesting, that's an interesting pushback, I guess, coming down to the corrupt state corruption and interest. But yeah, I'm not 100% convinced by your argument. I, th- I think it's just more credible that, yeah, partly I think what you say but also the fact that China just don't want to become the yeah. net importers. Net importer. Well, the rest of the world compared to what China does just doesn't make enough stuff. I mean, I don't it imagine. doesn't probably make enough stuff yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Until does. Africa gets yeah, uh, exactly. you know, ramped up. Yeah, yep, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there's that aspect to it. Um, yeah, you need a whole lot of other major countries. I think Africa, um, the subcontinent and all that. Uh, um, the thing is, China is sort of, in a way, getting there with the uh, one belt, one road mm-hmm. initiatives and that. They're, they're going to increase and lubricate trade uh, into Africa. They're not looking to be neo-colonialists there, at least not terribly so, maybe a little bit. But um, that's all. A, that's a huge long time span thing, all of that. I mean, getting Africa to become a, you know, a world top leading producer uh, of value added goods and that so that they produce enough surplus to the domestic needs that they can become an exporter without the IMF, without the sort of following the export lead growth model, you know? Yeah. So they're becoming very wealthy, very prosperous. Now they're producing more than they need, but it's not being exported, um, under IMF terms, punitive terms, but it's actually just true surplus like New Zealand. Yeah. So once Africa turns yeah. into a producer like New Zealand, like, well, they're like a hundred New Zealands. So then China becomes able to import a lot, and uh, you know the whole thing would then be much more balanced. But this is, well, you know, decades and decades. Yeah, probably. 
So U.S. is pretty secure for a long time. For a while. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, even even London still has a, a massive center for financial uh, yeah. you know, fi- financial transactions. And, you know, even their their time in the in the spotlights 200 years past or whatever. So um, I, I, I don't I don't know. Maybe I could be wrong. Maybe there will be one massive sudden sudden shift. Uh, out east. The other thing too that China has going against it is, I mean, it's just having a demographic fall off. I mean, it's set to lose the half of its oh, yeah. population over the next uh, over the next half century or whatever it is. Uh, I mean, it's close to that. Um, but the one thing China has does going uh, that it has going for it. I mean, if if if, if there is suspicion of the communist regime, right, from from kind of a legal framework side of things, what it does have going for it is it is clearly figured out that if it has a political will, it can do it. Right. I mean, it, it, right. it, it it's clearly not MMT, but it's a bit of a, a backdoor to, to MMT. Right. Um, and so it's not, yeah. you know, it's not afraid to, to do things, yeah. um, politically, uh, or just to get it done uh, when it has the political will. Which the U.S. can't. I mean, every flight today was grounded in the U.S. because we have a, a, a Windows 95 operating system operating the <laughs> key, you know, key, um, key uh, yeah, key flight system. Uh, decided to to get the blue screen of death today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's funny. <laughs> Um, uh, let's see, Josh, could the European union, uh, evolving more, uh, to have, uh, to full political union threaten the dollar supremacy European union is so far away because it is controlled by Germany for the most part and Germany wants, yeah, yeah, Germany wants to export, um, they want a very, you know, what they would call stable currency. They don't want any inflation for their own benefit. Uh, the Maastricht treaty, which is kind of the, yeah, you know, their self-imposed constant austerity, um, you know, force, <laughs> you know, forces them to operate in a certain well, they, way. So, yeah, this, I mean, they're slowly learning. Yes. Slo- a, slowly a, learning by like the painful method that um, they have to redistribute debt internally. And so the ECB has to be act like a currency issuer. Yep. So their problem is they don't have a parliamentary authority that, that just issues the currency and invests. It's all reliant upon the ECB uh, backing member nation debt. So that allows the member nation central banks to um, have run deficits. They just, uh, e- ECB buys their bonds. So it's left pocket paying right pocket, pocket still. It's still Bill Mitchell's, Bill, Mitchell, Bill Mitchell's story. But the problem they have is even if they figure it out internally, it just seems to be a lack of political will or understanding to operate like the USA. They don't want to flood the international markets with their with the euro. They want to keep the euro uh, tight. So like china they just um they're thinking wrongly about exchange rates is what i would say yeah, this is a discussion they, we've they had look at the exchange uh, rate and they, and they want yeah. the dollar the, the the thing to be strong and they don't realize that you know as long as you've got a healthy domestic economy that is fully employing people your currency will always be in demand and you can let the exchange rate be what it wants to be this is um <laughs> we, we were talking about this and, and I, I mean i know there's there's some dynamics here that might not be spot on but um Kind of like you know, you and I would actually be inflation hawks when defined properly with the you know with the right with the right uh-huh. mindset around it. I, I mean, I, I really think a because yeah, you make the currency hot so that it's circulating. Yes, faster. yeah, yeah, yeah. So the nominal inflation goes up, but the real wage um also goes yep. up even higher faster. Yep. So yep. the real you're not putting anyone under, uh, you know, into poverty. Yep, that's the thing. Yep. Yeah, sorry, I interrupted. Yeah, you. no, no. I, I mean, you have that aspect of it, which is going to, to a certain extent, pr- you know, push down relative to other currencies the value of that currency, and then also a currency yeah. in demand um, that is fueling endogenous money growth is going to have downward pressure on it. Uh, we, That's right. The dollar, when the dollar pushes lower, the 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 global financial system is doing better, and and vice versa. Um, yeah. So currencies that have downward pressure on them it doesn't necessarily mean that that currency is bad it's it's what is causing right. the downward pressure is the downward pressure because it's so yeah. in demand that people want to create loans in it um, right. to use that for you know increase in productive capacity 
or is it yeah. being pushed down because corrupt politicians are, you right. know, just trying to skim off the top? Right. Exactly. I, I, I mean, or there's a terrible. How it's, yeah. How it's moving matters, man. Yep. It's yep. a big deal. Yeah. Plus, it never has to result in any unemployment. So you yeah. can always maximize your, your output, no matter what the exchange rate does. Yeah. Just don't worry about the exchange rate. That's the key lesson of EMT. If you float, if you float, <laughs> I mean, don't issue foreign debt either. I mean, yeah, don't mm-hmm. issue foreign denominated debt. <laughs> well, yeah. Why would you borrow some, someone else's currency yep. if you don't need yep. to? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Use the, use the exchange go rate. It. It's a mechanism that works if you float. It, it even works, and this is where I disagree with people like um, Jan Kriegel and and uh, Fidel Kaboob. It works in the third world no matter what, right? you got to focus on full employment. Don't let the exchange rate be an obstacle to that. Um, don't peg your currency ever, really. You don't really need to. It's 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 when you've got massive corruption and things like that where um, uh, what you do to with your currency, whether it's floating, whether you know you run a job guarantee or whatever, um, is is almost irrelevant if you've got too much corruption. It's like Douglas said earlier: the rule of law is and stability in a kind of legal system is is paramount. And in that case, if you're in a country where there's massive corruption, what what I've said about the exchange rate not mattering and maximizing employment and all that it, it, that 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 becomes way way in the background because your biggest problem is the corruption. Well, actually, probably Fidel Kaboom and Jan Kriegel would agree with me on that. I guess, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, the point is is that is that once you've got a uh, once you've reigned in corruption to a you know, reasonable level, it's not too bad. Uh, then just run full employment, focus on that. Forget yep. about your exchange rate. People who draw a line when exchange is going down, and they draw a line extrapolating all the way down to zero value for the currency. <laughs> it's like that's a great example of the hazards of extrapolation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just this is extrapolate. Oh, the dollar's crashing. Crashing it's to gonna zero. hit zero yeah. by November. Yeah, twenty twenty four. Yeah. Okay, you know, you're just talking about lunatics here. So well, it, it's never going to go to zero because taxation drives the currency, and the fluctuations in the exchange rate anyway are mostly about speculation. And um, and so as far as trade goes, it's always just a redistribution effect, as Warren says. It's like um. You know, if you, if your uh, if your currency, um, you, you know, you most most people are trying to satisfy the export lobby, and that's that's why yeah. they want to yeah uh, keep keep the um, workers the wages low and and run austerity and all that, and they're not listening to their import lobby, so the importers are far better for your country. <laughs> So uh, you should probably listen to them more than your exporters, and then you won't worry about the exchange rate because all it does is shift the balance between importers and exporters. And so it, it can, you know, it has effects. It has effects, but with, if you don't run full employment or a job guarantee, um, because then if your exchange rate goes down a bit, you got people who might want to be buying imports or just through channels that pass through some of the inflation effects you know they're they're not now able to provide a dinner for their kids so um but those are redistribution policies in in your country so what you do there is you just you know raise your minimum wage you're running job guarantee and then and then people are happy and they can uh yeah, they can figure out what what goods they want to buy what basket of goods they want to buy and the exchange rate won't really matter so much if the real wage is is healthy so it's an internal redistribution story. You don't worry about the exchange rate. That's a, one of the big lessons of MMT, I think. Yeah. It, that it's not just benefits people in the United States. The MMT awareness benefits any country, every country. Which, to tie that into finance, a currency that's going down does not necessarily mean that that underlying economy is doing poor. I mean, in fact, right. I mean, a, a really good measure too, if you just measure um, uh, like a you know, distance from a moving average of the dollar or something like that, right? Some sort of, uh, some sort of um, 
oh r- relative relative movement of the dollar index w- when that thing is pushing lower uh, is you know it's pretty it's a pretty good indicator that uh, that stocks are about to take off and that sort of thing you're about to see growth so now obviously in a, in a country that is borrowing in someone else's currency right that's creating other other that's creating debt in someone else's currency that's a problem and right. and if you that's see true. you know if you see that that sort of thing happening turkey whatever uh argentina yeah. venezuela yeah. you know whatever they're doing yeah, obviously, that's that's not what we're talking about. Um, right, exactly. It's not what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I mean, we're we're, ta- we're talking about a country that's actually trying to expand you know, the, the resources yeah. that it uh, or the use of the resources that it has. Um, we got some good uh, comments coming in. Let's see. Um, Thomas D. China has six Westinghouse AM thousand nuclear plants under construction. Country with a non polluting energy will become the number one economy. I mean that, that yeah I think you could make a an argument for that. I would love to see my homeland start to push into that more. I really <laughs> I really think there could be a good I, I I don't know how you pull this off and I don't know how hard it is to uh transmit energy, you know, cross continentally. I, I, I don't know if there's some agreement that the that the US and and Europe could get together on. Um maybe maybe float that idea that Trump had of buying Greenland and just build a bunch of you know, nuclear power plants up in uh, Greenland and, and uh, <laughs> something like that. I don't, um, but uh, I mean, it seems like a missed opportunity um, one way or another yeah. to, to get some energy. Well, clean, that, clean that's energy. one example. That's probably perhaps one example of having, having a, um, yeah, a strong government like uh, the Chinese Central yep. Committee because yep. they can just go ahead and make those decisions. Yep. Uh, where you're getting p- political pressure groups in the U.S. who are anti-nuclear, so <laughs> the, but, you're yeah. going to have to go <laughs> more solar and so on. Not that you can't do that, but I agree. It's like you're going to get a major adva- advantage if you invest in non-polluting, uh, you know, renewables, energy, and energy like like you say, it drives the economy. But even then, you see oil. You have to you have to have cows or something to grow butter or corn. <laughs> Some if you're not going to dig up, dig up oil out of the ground uh, for your chemical feedstocks, not as a not as a fuel, but as a feedstock for the chemical industry and so on. So um, you can't go 100% nuclear because nuclear doesn't create the uh, yeah the, plastics the, industry, yeah and pharmaceuticals yeah, industry. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. So, yep. But with the energy, you can use, if you've got excess energy, then you can use that to uh, uh, to do a bit of uh, bit of chemistry. But yeah, that's critical. It's it's interesting that governments don't really realize that, right? That, that you, you just go all out. It's like a it's like a game. The games I I used to play maybe that um, where sometimes you just decide on a strategy and you just go all the hell for leather on it. <laughs> yeah it can be a bit of a gamble but uh it's like if it just works out then it's like oh you know you just become absolute king <laughs> uh yeah uh let's see josh talking about the master tree um yeah needs to go away i think warren mentioned uh, how some venezuela politicians were doing that exact same thing selling off their currency yeah i mean that'll That's happen right. i mean that is yeah yeah, I read some news stories about that in Florida. I think he, I think Warren Warren was right about that. <laughs> there was some pretty dodgy stuff going on. Oh wow! Good thing, good thing, uh, good thing the U.S. doesn't uh, have any politicians uh, that are uh, good thing u- yeah. utilizing exploiting their position of power. Exploiting uh, their position, yeah, because because you got rule of law there, right? So yes, yes, exactly. So it can't happen there. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> Very superior rule of law. My foot is uh, firmly planted in my mouth now. <laughs> Does this speak to the point of having food and energy security be one of the most important issues countries need to tackle uh, to insulate against exchange rate fluctuation? Yeah. What? Okay, the nuance there that I left out is that if you're a poor country, you can be held hostage. You can be held to ransom. If you need if you need imports, food and energy, um, uh, someone who's got those um available to export to you um they're kind of acting like for you uh they're acting like a monopolist they can just set the price so they can drive your currency 
uh, exchange rate down or or use pass through inflation to inflate your currency massively if they you know if they just keep increasing their price well what do you do you got a fiat currency you just keep regaging your currency until they give up that's the thing you see you, you don't worry about it okay so politically psychologically it's a problem you got to sell to the people the idea that if their real wage is rising they can still afford everything they need to survive live a comfortable life and your just currency keeps on inflating because the person you're buying your oil from just keeps on raising the price but, but you know eventually i mean that, that, let me a, let me push back on that yeah. thought though here right okay because uh you know if i have if I, if I live in the in the land of doug landia right and i have my my yeah. my doug land dollars um the only reason that anyone want would want my doug land dollars is if I have something to then exchange once they get my Dougland dollars to sell them back, yeah. right? Yeah. So at, at some point, they just if if you if you go that route, wouldn't you just end up t signaling to the supplier of energy, uh, the supplier of oil, that like, look, we're just not going to have enough of whatever it is that we could export uh -huh. for you to buy, so they're just going to yeah. stop selling to you. Yeah. So if there's if there's only you know if for you there's a monopolist uh, doing that to you, then you kind of stuffed. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. That's that's exactly right. But I think the real world is never never gets that way, right? Well, yeah. There's, there's, yeah. There's internationally agreements and that it, it would be like um, it would be just too bold faced imperialistic to the people wouldn't tolerate it. You know. So eventually uh other countries would sort of um do do something to help you out so the thing is, is is you're not isolated if you're a poor country like that and you're being really gouged uh it it becomes obvious that that this is what is happening but it, and um there's massive pressure internationally that to, against those monopolists who are just totally exploiting a poor nation but at some uh, point it benefits a poor nation to have uh, 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 to be able to consume what it generates um to consume what it produces locally and then have some sort of uh some sort of extra to export yes uh yes so, i mean you, you absolutely have to, you have to at least get to that point yeah yeah uh if yeah, you, you don't you don't yeah. just uh, get to that point and then shut down and say oh we'll, we'll stop growing yeah <laughs> yeah yeah because because you want to maybe uh increase quality of life uh as, as much as possible and so eventually you do get into a position of being able to export some of your surplus the surplus I mean, you could yeah. say new yeah. zealand is new zealand is that story right initially we started off like nothing and then had some farmland and then you know gradually built things up until we've now become net importers Yep, and everything's hunky dory except everyone thinks we should be exports because <laughs> you're worried about the dollar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. I think you're right, I, and, I, and I think um, you know this is where most sage economists would, would would say is that you know there's a real problem with uh, imperialism and people pushing around the poor countries, but it never gets so bad uh, until someone invades you that that you can't have some sort of international pressure. So that your currency isn't just going to hyperinflate like mad. So the hyperinflations um, usually don't come from that uh, that monopoly, that external monopolist price gouging you. They usually come from other the, the hyper, the real hyperinflations, where you you you're just constantly force, forcing forcing yeah. being forced to regauge your currency. Yeah. They come from the the, the famines, the war. Yep. Um, yep. The corrupt massive corruption that sort of thing not not from trade so so you i'd say don't ignore the trade uh justice issues right they're so important to that the international community and the un works on so that so that you know some monopolist somewhere isn't just thoroughly exploiting some little wee pacific island nation somewhere in the middle of nowhere right? but if you're that small that you don't have the um sufficient domestic output to to buffer your price level if you're really that small you've got to wonder whether you are a nation at all you maybe want to join a a, a union of nations or something yeah like that. yeah yeah that's a good point
Yeah. So you give up a little bit of political sovereignty, but in order to gain a hell of a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to gain access. Yeah. I know that's a, so I mean, it's a tough decision to give up your sovereignty as a nation, as a cop, as a sort of people who self identify. It's a yep. real tough thing if you're, if you're just a small. Yeah. Country. Puerto Rico. That's exactly what I was yeah, going like to say. Puerto, I mean, Puerto Rico is a great example. Yeah. 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 So I, they should be joining a union of um, Carib Caribbean nations, not the USA, right? Well, or. I mean, they, they have the worst, they have to pay taxes to the U.S., <laughs> but have no yeah. representation. I, I mean, yeah. they, they really need to either become a state and get the full benefit of, of the federal, you know, of the federal government or right. join, yeah, some, some, uh, uh, yeah, Caribbean uh, agreement or something like that. But yeah. they, they are in a bad spot. Um, yeah. But I mean, that's a good story. Yeah. I mean, that's where everyone can see the injustice there. Yeah. So. It's not an MMT problem. They know what to do if you're an MMT in Puerto Rico. You just can't do it because, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. If, you... I don't know if everyone can see the problem, but <laughs> the, the... Uh, I don't know. Everyone's everyone sort of has an idea that that's, that's the problem. That that is wrong. It's yeah, political yeah. level, not yeah. not financial. Level. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, technical question about the rate hikes. Yeah. Get out your crystal ball. Yeah. I, I mean, I think at this point, let me put it this way. I don't know what the Fed is going to do, um, but I do think the market is starting to price in that the Fed is done. And I take that just by the 10 year yield. And I think the 10 year yield is going to start to come down based on my little my little model. I, I, you know, Hamel, maybe you, you stepped away um, when we went over this, but I, I can definitely bring it up again. Um, this is it. There we go. Uh, this is the you know the employee tax from the daily treasury statement. The the acceleration of that. Um, I went over that in the in the first hour of the live stream. So if, if you want the full explanation, check that out. But I think the ten year yield starts to you know come down. I think bonds uh, have have stopped their descent and will slowly start to push higher. And so if you agree that all the yield curve is is just kind of an expression of where traders think. The Fed is going to be um, at that point in time, and if the you know if yields are starting to to top and push lower, then I think they're anticipating uh, the Fed to take their foot off the gas. And and again, the Fed looks at growth, uh, growth, inflation, and employment, and over and over again, they've talked about the employment, uh, the employment aspect of this being the determining factor for where they're going to be at with rates. I think uh, I think we're going to start to see the. Well, that's a big one. Yeah. I think yeah, I think we're going to start to see the employment aspect of this really start to fall off yes. uh, in 2023. The pressure, the pressure. I, I don't think we're going to see yeah. a recession at this point, um, but yeah. I think we'll see enough to where the Fed says, "Okay, we've done yeah. what we've needed to do. We've been successful, yeah. even though it wasn't them the entire well, time." I, <laughs> I qualify. I, I, I'd like to modify that, attenuate that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Because what what'll happen is they'll. They want to go to the Nairu. <laughs> yeah. And, you yeah. know, that's a magical number they, they come up with with, with models, um, DSG type models. So um, with, so you see jobs still growing, but you, if you see it become concave rather than convex, you know, so, so if, once the rate of growth of new jobs slows, it, jobs, um, employment could still be going up, but they just want to see um, it start to level off. And then they'll they'll think, you know, because their thinking is backwards. <laughs> they'll, yeah. they'll take their foot off <laughs> off the uh, you know accelerator of the interest rate, and then uh, bring bring them down. And in combination with other things, but I think unemployment will be a key. They they want to see a Nairu so that they, in their own minds, they can go to bed happy, thinking that they've cured inflation. <laughs> they've cured inflation, but in, in reality, <laughs> would actually clear. They want to yeah. think, yeah. But in yeah. reality, they just they they, don't, they have it all backwards. So, yeah. Um, yeah. so that's my, so, yeah, that's so my it's going to be a recession. It's going to be a, a, it's going to be a recession in terms of M what MMT says is the maximum policy space available. I mean, not so much recession, but it's going to be not, not a full recovery, uh, because they, they don't see, they don't see full employment as, as full recovery. They see that as an inflationary risk. So yeah. Yeah. So yeah they don't point. stop short, short of that. And then they'll bring rates down thinking they've cured everything. Yeah. <laughs> by picking at the scab. <laughs> um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. But interesting, yeah.
I bet that'll do. be interesting stuff to feed into a agent based model. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Hamel, I mean, <laughs> it is, it is on my to-do list to do kind of a fed predictor. Um, I mean, obviously the, you know, even when you look at those dot charts and stuff like that, the dot plot that they put out, I mean, even the fed has been terribly wrong at guessing what the fed is going to do. Right. So, uh, hang on. What did you say? Oh, the Fed has been terribly wrong. Yeah, historically, <laughs> hyster been historically, been. the Fed is way off okay. at understanding. I, I mean, I, I think it's like within six months, um, their own guess of what they're going to do becomes a coin flip, right? I, I mean, the, the, oh man, that's yeah. a good, that's a good tweet meme. Or something. Yeah, yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to find. You know, maybe I could calculate the exact percent, but I, I'm sure if if you're in, you know, if, if anyone's watching this, then in the, the space, they've seen the dot plot, and then they've, you know, people have extrapolated out, where, you know, where rates actually went following that dot plot. Oh yeah, and it's, you know, I mean, they're just they're they don't, yeah, they don't know what they're doing. Yeah, they know what they're gonna do. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure there's a good uh, there's a good wife joke in there somewhere, but uh, <laughs> I, I won't go. I won't go that route. Um, I guess I kind of did. I, I, <laughs> I, I will tell you though, um, we we do need uh, we we do need the 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 inflation situation to kind of turn the corner here though for the market to to avert. A recession. I mean, I think that'll be the that'll be really the the big thing through 2023, um, and it really just has to do with uh, mm. with the way in which you know, kind of the well. I mean, it's like the 1970s recessions that we saw, um, relatively high inflation, the the relative de deficit, the the real deficit um, remains uh, remains relatively compressed. And, uh, and I think that's kind of one of the big things that we need to see take place, which is why I do think, I mean, I think it is going to play out that way. I mean, I think we are going to see a cooling of inflation, um, again, as, as the Fed measures it. And, yeah, but uh, it's an interesting question, right? So, so has, I haven't seen Warren or anyone tweet on that. Like, so is, is the uh, real, you know, government uh, budget position actually now already in surplus when you can factor in inflation? I'm sorry. When you say that the, is the government deficit in surplus? Uh, well, like in the seventies. Yeah, it was. Trying to see yeah, it was. If we've gotten to the seventies yet, uh, the government was running deficits there, but in real terms, it was a surplus. A surplus. Because of the yeah. Inflation rate. Give me a second to see if I ever saved it that far back. Whoops. There we go. That's the one I wanted. Um, give me a second to pull this up. <laughs> I, I might. Everyone have... in our chat knows if it if it if it is a real surplus, it's it's recessionary pressure. Technically, technically, okay. I'm gonna actually let me let me jump back to this. I, I shouldn't share this, but this is to me this is it's my be the best feature we've got. But I'll, I'll share it. Here is the daily treasury statement, real time daily real deficit, um, that I'm sharing. And this is it's not actually the rate. Yeah, this is actually the acceleration. It's not the rate of change. This should say real okay. deficit acceleration. Um, and I think you know, it is the, if it is the rate of change, it, we're still in a deficit, but we're still below the zero mark. Um, we're turning the corner. If it wasn't for the fact that I'm dividing this out by, by inflation, uh, obviously we'd be, we'd be, you know, sky high right now, but, um, in, in real terms, we're still negative. The acceleration is still negative. It's turning the corner. Um, and, and as you guys can see, uh, this is the acceleration versus the S and P returns. So there, there's a very clear signal here. I mean, you can see why, um, this is going to be a powerful signal in our models. This is effectively what I use already in the Bayes models, but, uh, I mean, this is, you know, a learning algorithm is, is going to love this, but yeah, we, if, if inflation gives way, if CPI gives way, uh, you're going to see just a massive acceleration of, of what, what I just call the fiscal flows that the daily spending that we see. Yeah. Um, so there's that aspect of it. Let me let me let me jump off this back to chat real quick, and I'll, I'll see if I can't find this going back to the 1970s. Um, God, I have it going yeah, to ahead. the I have it going to the 80s. I don't have it going back to the 70s. Uh, yeah, I think. Go ahead, though. Yeah. No, it'd be good to look it up. Look it up. Just trying to pass um, Hamel's comment there. Um. The way the government raises the deficit, so in, injects net spending, is important. Right? 
So whether it supports em employment or just support, supports more the rentiers is the question. Not just, you can't just look at the government deficit continuing to grow um, as going to be directly uh, supporting employment. It all depends where that, where that deficit gets spent, where it gets targeted. So it may not. It may not um, keep the Fed raising rates because it, because probably it's going to be mostly rentier income, and if uh, if that's not used to employ people, <laughs> I think the unemployment um, figures are going to maybe keep going up a little bit. But I think the rate of growth of unemployment is going to slow down. The rate of change of it, and when the Fed sees that, they're probably going to think it's okay to take their foot off the accelerator, thinking it's the brake. So I think, yeah, I probably would agree with Douglas. All, all the signs look like they're going to um, ease back. Um, I'm, I'm still trying to figure this out in my data, and I just okay, keep going. I just don't think uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to pull it together, <laughs> piece it together, yeah. uh, on yeah. the fly here. I, God, I wish I could. Um, I think it's yeah, kinda... probably Josh. Yeah. It's, a, it's 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 definitely increasing wealth inequality the way uh, Congress is going about the spending. But I have to tell you, it's pretty much the same in New Zealand. Even you know we've got a left wing green green plus Labor government. Um, they they do the, they do the spending the same way. They give the bonds to the volunteers. So we we do have. A uh, widening of the poverty or wealth gap, for sure. This is the way they do it. it as speaking to Thomas, Thomas's point, yeah, you can you can count on the central banks to do it the wrong way around. Uh, so the way to do it, oh, just right. to repeat, the way to do that is to not support the economy through higher interest rates, but um, take the rentier sector out of play. So go to zero interest rate policy. Which is what are the a lot of the libertarians really hate, you know, Nassim Taleb and all that. They don't like it. <laughs> but you go to zero interest rate and you support the economy from the bottom. Job guarantee. All right, I'm jumping back in mentally. I, I can't. I couldn't exactly end up pulling it up um, okay. to actually show. Well, we can. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I take that back. Hold yeah. on a second. Let me let me do this. Yeah. I can at least show what the national. Yeah. Yeah, what the national debt was in real terms. Um, hey, you're doing this in real time, man. This is amazing. So let me <laughs> let me switch to that. Man with the charts. Um, again, uh, you know, take take stock of the chart that I'm about to switch off of because um, that's the magic one. That is that is. Uh, you know, one of the things we've been learning and as we kind of you know, piece together every every factor that we want to do for for the the, the first go at our neural net is um, you know what you learn in, in 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 finance in terms of what actually affects a price there's going to be you know one one factor one feature is going to is going to be predictive of 30 to a half percent of 50 percent of a price right and the next feature is going to be you know 20 percent the next feature is going to be 10 and whatever right I mean, I, yeah. I, I really think the core MMT story is right, that really what is affecting particularly the financial markets is more than anything else, um, the, the, the fiscal channel. So, um, yeah. I mean, I think that's it's at least what, what I've, I've gleaned from, from my research. All right, switching over to, this is the, uh, national debt over time in real terms and you can um you can certainly see back in the 1970s we you know we dipped lower similar to what we did in uh 2000 and then you know the sideways we did in 2008 so i don't have the deficit in real time on this um mm -hmm. but you can certainly see that that we pushed lower here so uh that's the blue line to inflation adjusted mm -hmm. so it did, yeah. I mean, we reached negative um, in the nineteen seventies, which, to a certain extent, that's where we're back at. Um, that's where we're back at. We were at momentarily uh, in the U.S. Yeah. All right. Those are that's my chart to share. <laughs> yeah, you can see 
MMT uh, may be taking a little bit of a. I'm sorry, having I... a little influence perhaps, because now the dip isn't so great. But yeah, yeah, I think that was log scale, so it should scale correctly for the dip. Okay. Um, I mean, really, what happened <laughs> it, it, in terms of financial markets? What really happened is in one, you had this massive overhedging that took place following the invasion of Ukraine, and then two, um, tax season hit, and we had the biggest tax tax receipt that we've ever had i mean it's just uh i would almost say orders of magnitude larger than i think we've ever had uh for the april tax season um uh, and that just you know i mean that, that really put us into uh, a mini crunch there so but we're we're yeah. escaping that at this point um uh, back to the chat though i i <laughs> okay by, by osmosis a few new zealand comments yeah by osmosis i was hearing a little bit so <laughs> um, um, I tried to I tried to address Josh's comment about uh, spending, but I'm not sure. Let me let me know if you are, if you want to ask, rephrase that question. As far as New Zealand goes, it's quite interesting. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the more um, leadership level people um, have the same understanding of MMT as uh, Paul Krugman or Larry Summers okay which is to say pretty much zero understanding so firstly they're not going to do mt they say they don't want to do mt which as we all know is wrong because if you look at new zealand's uh, acts of parliament and the st legal statutes and a public finance act um it's a, it's a total mt system <laughs> so, you know you have you have no option we're already doing mt in new zealand other policy is our government policy aware of it not really so much but the labor government used to be uh, back in the 60s and 70s i mean they used to be very pro worker they were they were as close as we you know we ever get to uh, democratic socialism in new zealand um so in a sense they they can do some mmt, MMT policies but it, we're also heavily tourist and agricultural based and so they get that kind of wrong you know they want to produce a lot of agricultural export for some reason they you know they want to <laughs> it's like if we have a surplus it's fine like Douglas said before we can export our agricultural surplus and the thing is we do we are cap way capable of feeding ourselves but you know we don't we're not necessarily great at growing uh i don't know bananas or coffee or whatever so we can certainly do we do really fine with trade uh, so in a way, New Zealand looks like an MMT economy, and it looks good. But Thomas is right. Um, so our finance minister is, is a total knucklehead. Um, so he can he can say you know <laughs> that he's uh, pro union and everything, and you know on the side of the unions or whatever. But it doesn't mean much if he doesn't really support them, and he's instead supporting the the, the rentier class. Uh, but okay so having said all that um i know people in our government who are aware of mmt mmt and they're like rand or race described they don't want to say they know about mmt they you know they're followers not leaders they're sheep and it's until we have a population in new zealand um real active pressure groups and uh, you're really visible and loud and until the, until people get taught it in school, I think um, the, the the political leaders will not admit that they know uh, MMT. That's 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 the case. So it's, currently, it's a coalition government. The Green Party support the Labour Party, and people in the Green Party I know are aware of MMT. Talk to Stephanie Kelton even. Um, so yeah, they know they know MMT. It's, it's this silly situation we got. Which, in, in one sense, scared. in one sense, I'm, I mean, I'm glad these politicians realize this reality. So, like, I, you know, I, I mean, I, I realize the response to the to COVID was just messy and sloppy, and any other adjective you want to throw on there. But at yeah. least they understood this time around. <laughs> that yeah, yeah. if the fiscal channel doesn't get pumping 
you're going to have a complete yeah. collapse in asset prices. Yeah. Right. I mean, they, they at least yeah. understood that yeah. Yeah. we could end up with a permanent 50% unemployment and yeah. all assets going to zero in very short yeah. order. Um, Although this is a counterfactual, I'm pretty sure even if the GOP had power over COVID, it would have been the same. The GOP they was in power. They don't want, they, 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 want to. they were in power. Oh, they Tr were? Trump was president when it, yeah. After COVID. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, well, okay. When it changed, when it when it changed hands. Yeah. Uh, if it had been the other way around, I'm pretty sure still they would have done fiscal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and the automatic stabilizers are such that they almost don't have an option. Yeah. Imagine, imagine having to go into Congress, even as even GOP led one now, and saying, you know, you're going to really cut the unemployment benefit and yeah, <laughs> just, yeah. Don't th even in their wildest dreams, they're never going to be able to get that to happen. Yeah. Uh, so the automatic stabilizers are there. Yes, it's terrible that it's it's insufficient for people in dire need, but uh, yeah, they they weren't going to. I don't think they had the the political uh, will power to not turn on the spigots. They had to, almost no choice. You see, you see the grass in the gar garden turning brown or well, you turn on the hose. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Even if you really don't, even if you think dry, dry weather and sun baked soil is, is good for the grass, <laughs> you turn on the hose. Right. Uh, let's see. What else do we got here? I saw another stupid YouTube debate. Confusing capitalism is the opposite of uh, socialism. You probably were listening to me debate that with Bijou. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just think that's kind of funny. Um, yeah, wait until people can retire at the age of 50 with a living wage. Or, or uh, living well, currency issuing, self-government pension. Yeah. There will be some annoyed voters. Yeah. Yeah, Josh, I think the, the – yeah, I mean, the Republicans had control um, for quite a while. Did very little with it in reality, <laughs> looking back at it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah, that shows you some of the constraints. <clears> oh, <throat> uh, yeah. Thomas again. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. New Zealand has an MMT system, but they're using unemployed buffers of labor. Yeah. Totally. Absolutely. <sighs> Sometimes I wonder, you know, is New Zealand going to be able to to actually uh, break out um, out from under the shadow of Australia and New Zealand and USA and uh, just decide to go for it, go for it with full employment? It seems like they're progressive we, enough we, to give it a shot. I mean, it seems like we do have yeah. we do have um, a constituency for that. Yeah, um, they definitely picked leaders that seem progressive yeah. enough to want to try something like that at least you know from what i can understand yeah. looking at it from over here in america yeah um big dog had a question earlier what about the risk i uh, have the risk of of, of well, world war been discussed tonight i'll tell you what after <laughs> after what's happened to russia in their attempt to just move a, a little west um i would imagine <laughs> I would imagine any country attempting to gain more territory um, might might take might take stock of that and choose choose a different path to get what they want. Um, so you define what you mean by world war. Uh, uh, I don't see it as a, even a remote possibility. <laughs> Someone could accidentally trigger a nuclear exchange. People will call that a world war. But I'm pretty sure it would be an accident at this stage. Yeah, uh, you know, and there are. If you read some of the docu, if you listen to some of the documentaries on that, how people, how the world has come close to someone misfiring. You know, some submarine commander <laughs> way back when, who was a bit isolated. You know, didn't have the communication channels. The radio was down, and then you get some sort of signal that there's some sort of launch of a missile. Yeah, on Moscow or whatever, and he he's got a he's got a have the fate of the world in this one person's hands or something like that. I think those days are pretty much gone. Although you do hear some stuff about how fragile the Russian uh, defense forces, because they don't have a great system for um, being able to delay 
the decision to launch. So if they see the sort of faint whiff of a nuclear strike from somewhere else, like the, or mainly only from the USA, they they might actually hit the button. But but those are like real big scary scenarios, right? And and I don't even know if that counts as a world war. It's just a yeah tragic ac- tragic yeah. accident. Yeah, which you know we really got to do our best to minimize and to make it make it zero poss- zero probability somehow. Uh, it does seem like that is a tragic accident waiting to happen. Yeah, um, I, I agree. So you'll all have to move down to New Zealand to avoid that. Yeah, I mean that's what that's what the yeah speculation which, which, from the fallout. If uh, it's if, all going to go in on jet stream around the northern hemisphere, I think Ty is right here that uh, what would be best for yeah, New Zealand is to merge that would with Australia. Benefit Australia. <laughs> Uh, I was I was going to give Ty the jab and say I think the same thing with Canada and the U.S. Right? They should just uh, become fifty-one. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the Australians allowed us to join them. That's very that's, nice of them. Is that is that true? Is that true that you guys have the right to join? I mean, once yeah. they start bailing out and moving, wanting to immigrate over here, we'll we'll deny them. They'll become the boat. I mean, the thing is, Australia is. It's a horrible country. <laughs> got no soil. The topsoil is completely uh, depleted. They've got no really good fresh water. They'll have to go back to desalination. <laughs> they want to grow their pop- grow their population and not rely on uranium. So you know, it, it, it's going to be a detriment to New Zealand to merge with Australia. Uh, I know Ty's only joking, but but you know, the, everyone else in the chat should uh, should be aware of the the intricacies of the Commonwealth system. Canada is part of that. Yeah, that's hilarious, man. We're going. I, we we joke. Uh, Bijou and I joke about hour three going off the rail and being whatever we want it to be. We're we're getting we're getting it tonight. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We we are officially in hour three. So so there's it's it's no holds bar. We can we can discuss anything. So while while a few more questions pile up in the chat, can I can you uh, put on my uh, yeah screen there? yeah absolutely do you want the tablet uh or yeah yeah, yeah do the tablet just to show i can see oh, i don't know me you know i i don't have any fancy visuals or drawings today but uh in case people don't just uh, kind of falling asleep now you can read or listen to me but i just wanted to say uh we've lost ro and nora but um in the chat there was a comment on on my f- use of physics analogies which i i kind of want to defend but also want to uh deflate as well so when you whenever i use p- physics analogies because i'm a physicist <laughs> I, yeah, that's, that's why but but so just just in terms of philosophy of science right this is causal chain from um physics at the base and up to chemistry and then biology and maybe population biology. I'm missing I'm missing out some levels in, in these emergent hierarchies here. <clears throat> and then so there's probably a whole lot of sciences in between population biology and economics, psychology, whatever. And then higher level than that, you've got political economy. And then the highest level of that, you've got morality, ethics, and justice. And so if you can, if you can, if if you're misunderstanding that I'm talking about uh moral political economy and justice economic justice uh in terms of physics because i think it can all be reduced to physics you better you know check your sanity meter because that's not what i'm talking about so when i talk about these forces and generalized forces and accelerations and that firstly the accelerations that we're uh, plotting to have a look at are only accelerations they're not the forces the forces uh let's talk about this with douglas the other day so the forces are often things that we'd call, you know, insider information, like the, who has the levers of power. So that's all at the political level where morality versus immorality, ethics versus corruption and, and justice versus injustice are, um, and the interests of the political class, the interests of the capitalist class, as opposed to the worker class, the, the whole class warfare, those are a massive mix of forces that, um, that my physics analogies are only sort of giving a sort of impressionistic picture of. But in terms of the time series analysis, there, there is a lot of uh, physics-like uh, causation going on there. 
but we're never going to understand all the forces. But in any case, on C-SPAN, you can get uh, decrypted channels of very devious uh, means <laughs> to have a look at all the forces that are working. Maybe not. They don't probably C-SPAN the uh, Fed board meetings yet, but you can still read those. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, it's not it's not like i don't want to say take the physics analogies with a grain of salt i, I think take them for what they are they're like uh, sometimes metaphors but sometimes they can be a bit more if you get if you uh, are prepared to um, just understand that i'm not saying that economics is anything like physics but there is there's certain certain ways of understanding if you've got a better way of understanding it like in terms of more of a biological system or in terms of like and unemployment is, is it spreads just like an epidemic right? so the dynamics of that time series is just like an epidemic it spreads and so you can catch unemployment so to speak at a, at a that's interesting level. yeah yeah not person to person but yeah from yeah <laughs> from uh, region to region <laughs> yeah so it's not like a yeah, virus. <laughs> that's what i mean it's oh, like no. you could use oh, the yeah, analogy yeah yeah, yeah 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 but then all of a sudden people are going to hear you saying that uh, that the government wants to institute a mask mandate to stop unemployment yeah, yeah. <laughs> i know yeah, yeah. unemployment uh, inoculation yeah yeah to get it yeah so yeah. that would just bring out the lunatics yeah so anyway so the analogies are fine but take it for what it is and then when I talk about justice level, you know, ah, oh, man. Let me let me let me let me of... let me linger on that one point though, real quick. Um, okay. Because I really think the 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 uh, a fundamental problem we have when talking about the economy is we just don't have a proper language to talk about the economy, and so we're forced to come up with an analogous language to talk about the economy yeah. because the economists yeah. that are in charge don't understand what the economy yeah. is. So we've never actually had a language yeah. build once we finally understood what the heck was happening um in, in reality like we have with biology like we have with physics All right we don't have right. that uh in, in economics yet and so we're you know yeah we, we, we need that language anyway next yeah, yeah yeah you got you got things that you can definitely measure so that's why mmt is important because it partly identifies things that you can actually measure in, in the macro so so what a lot of people don't understand is that um, when they say MMT is, is just accounting, so this is, this is Steve King dig, <laughs> dig at MMT, is right? Well, yeah, I mean, so the accounting relations are all software. Well, they, they used to be, they're basically, it's a legal system. And as, as far as the country is sticking sticking to the legal system, not, not operating counterfeit presses and things like that, then the accounting rules are going to hold pretty well. Uh, but MMT is far more than that. Like I said, as Mosler said before, uh, said, uh, what is MMT? You can define it. I, I've got some axioms and some uh, facts and some principles that define MMT. I won't go into them now, but, you know, fiat currency, sovereign issuer, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the way Warren said, said it, I'll repeat this again. Hopefully every live stream we do, I'll repeat it so that everyone gets a chance to hear it. MMT is um, recognizing... Uh, the government is a currency monopolist and the implications thereof and that's a huge amount to say the implications thereof okay that's fast that's talking about all the power dynamics and everything that go into what it means to be a, a monopoly currency issuer okay but then okay so people on sort of my side of the aisle or the lefties they they attack me like well whose justice are you talking about you know so well, I would obviously say that um, our justice system is the justice that the powerful get uh, because we're not fighting enough for it. So if you, you get whatever justice system you're prepared to fight for. And all I'll say about that uh, is that um, I would just say try not to make it violent. Violent fighting, MMT, gives you a framework where you can make it intellectual. And you can make the class warfare an intellectual battle fight it intellectually fight it spiritually be on the right side don't res don't resort to violence this be, would be my little uh plug for that basically i mean i don't think you have to resort to violence if you pick up a gun instead of picking up a megaphone or a you know or a make your own youtube channel put out some <laughs> a, content a live stream to, yeah, yeah 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 become a teacher go become a primary school teacher and teach kids in school you need to yeah I, 
that's a powerful, powerful weapon, much more powerful than any gun. Just takes a long time to uh, load and lock and fire. Uh, yeah, so again, just repeat the economics. I'm not, I'm not trying to formalize it like physics, just analogies at this stage. But some of them are pretty good, accelerations and so forth. They really do show drivers of uh, movements and prices. Um, yes, yeah, so besides C-SPAN, uh, there are other forces, right? The, the, the black market operators and so on, which you don't get access to on C-SPAN. <laughs> okay, that's all. I, so we had some other interesting things to talk about, but I'll go back to the chats for a second. One thing I do want to talk about if, if people in the chat are interested is how to have conversations with your families uh, about MMT. Uh, because both Douglas and I have families that are a bit recalcitrant, a bit resistant. Uh, I'm, I'm, glad you, yeah. I'm glad you put in resistant after recalcitrant. I was going to have to go to the dictionary real quick for that. <laughs> All right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, right. Uh, and so, yeah. We, we've got little war, war stories and like i said try the dog and bone story and try the pompeii stories uh, things that people can really relate to and uh, simple and not too not too nerdy and geeky and not too much jargon involved uh, you might find some pickup from your family members there and douglas and i've been having an ongoing bit of a debate about whether the job guarantee is better than the salaire a v so in fact, in fact, it got to the point where Douglas knows more about Le Solaire V than I do. <laughs> he actually watched some YouTube clips about it. But the idea there is to fully try and decommodify labor. And I think the job guarantee is a step in that direction. But whether we want to go full, like, uh, you know, uh, this Le Solaire V is, is closely tied to socialism. And so it's a bit... in. It's not palatable in countries like the USA, except for a certain constituency. And so it's a kind of an interesting thing to look at. Have, have a look at it, I reckon. If you've got any questions about it, come back to us next week on it and we'll see. Maybe we can do a discussion of that. If, if you're interested, we could do it now. But um, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a fun, it's a fun discussion, like just from like yeah. a job, from a job guarantee, like the MMC job guarantee, a UBI to something like a salary for life for those of us who don't speak French. Um, <laughs> uh, I make it, uh, make it, <laughs> yeah, 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 differential equations. Yeah. If someone, if someone speaks fluent, ordinary differential equations, then yeah, then you're, you've already won. You just have to, yeah, show them the logic. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, it seems like casual yeah, conversation. So yeah, yeah. 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 Did you guys see how bad TCU got beat? Well, I can really express that in differential <laughs> equations. Um, <laughs> gosh. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, yes. Uh, salary for life. I, I really, you know, so when, when, when Bijou and I first started kind of debating this, I think I was on the UBI train because my thought was with UBI that, you know, eventually right. we'll get to this point where we'll have such automation that we're just going to, you know, you're going to need UBI because there's just not going to be enough, you know, employable people. Um, but my, you know, Bijou made the the, the good counterpoint, which I, I I can't think of any defeater for, and that is, you know, as, as long as there's something for you to add to society, you can call that employment, right? You just, you know, yeah. and, and the government can have a yeah. very wide definition of what it's going to call a job Why guarantee generously expand the whole idea of work yeah it becomes a spiritual thing so it's not it's not a chore it's not a debt to society that you're paying back through work it's not work for you it's like it's just your your contribution yeah whatever you want to whatever you want to contribute as long as like i said it's not like professional ars arsony or <laughs> yeah yeah so any anyone who says and, and actually one of the uh i forget her name she, she had a really i mean she has some really good videos but uh she was like a socialist um kind of a a, a marxist Mexi? socialist yeah Mexi. Yeah, yeah 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 um you know her point was that it, uh, ubi will give the opportunity for uh for people to you know learn new things etc cetera, etc cetera. but then the counterpoint is no just make that a job that gets paid exactly <laughs> um whatever good you can do with ubi yeah should yeah. be paid a better yeah. wage and, and, and a decent wage with holiday and benefits and 
worker protection. So that's a job guarantee. I, I also think, I, I don't, I mean, this is just, just me kind of spitballing here and we'll, we'll see. And, and hopefully some academics can do some research, but it really does make me wonder um, what, and I don't know, the, the word good is not the right word, but what good was actually done post COVID during uh, the direct payments, right? You know, the, effectively, you know, we tested yeah. out UBI. I mean, how, how many people two years later are now in more debt because they got, um, you know, a sudden expansion of income or, you know what I'm saying? Like, like what is the unintended consequence on the emotional side of just getting free income? Um, you know, what, what is that, what does that look like down the line, uh, of, of what a UBI would be? Um, so we'll, we'll obviously have a good a case study to see kind of what, what some of that was, but at the end of the day, I think a job guarantee makes a lot of sense. I just I think it's very hard to explain, uh, particularly to a, a Western appetite, what a job guarantee would be. You know, I mean, it's uh, yeah. and, and tell you well, really, they see neoliberals in power, and they see okay, well, they're going to make us, you know, make semiconductor chips. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you got to try and say, well, hang on, no, that's that's not what the job guarantee does. It's, it's not work fair. It's not the government telling you what to do. Yep. You choose what work you want to do. The government just pays the wage bill. Yep. Because um, they're not going to allow you to choose any old thing, but they will allow you to choose anything that benefits your local community. So it's like uh, it's like uh, distributing democracy. You know, having more democracy at a local level, so you don't have to go crying to the government for handouts. But I thought I thought you were going to say the more steel man case for the job guarantee was that the UBI is a claim on someone else's yeah, labor. Yep. So you don't actually have to do any good with your um, UBI. You know, not everyone's an altruist. So. Yeah, 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 so, yeah. But the job guarantee doesn't force you to be an altruist. It just says you can do any job that's, that is, suits your local community, which could be professional arsony, actually, you know, if your local community is into that. <laughs> but, but, you know, that'd probably get shut down, right? So so there would be limits. Not, but, not in some cities. <laughs> not in some cities. Oh, I, don't know. I don't know. I'll have to take your word on that. Uh, so, yeah, so the, the job guarantee is the opposite. It's your claim on the government. But you got you just got to understand the, the, um, the policy proposal for the job guarantee. Yeah. Sure. A neoliberal could come up and say, yeah, we're going to do... Uh, Keynesian policy and just get everyone to dig ditches. Okay, so that's not the job guarantee. Dig ditches and fill them up again. Sorry, I should say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's just anti-job guarantee. Yeah, yeah. Nothing to do. With Which I also think, if I mean, if, if if they could couch a job guarantee in in the manner in which we're saying, I think that helps go a long way. Uh, will help go a long way to kind of redefining the the stigma of the government in yeah is in the government paying you to do something as yeah. well i mean i think there's, do something. Yeah. there's an aspect of that um I and mean, you've got to have the training i mean now i can imagine a whole lot of people would be happy with it if it includes uh paid uh education training because a lot of people uh will not want a lot of people want to go back to the private sector and so they're doing the dog and bone story. So they're, you know, 100 dogs chasing 90 bones. So get, get back into the private sector. They now have got to make themselves attractive to employers. So how are you going to do that on the you, patents of a UBI? Yeah. I don't, think, I don't think that works. So it works for right-wingers and left-wingers. And I think that's got to be the MMT narrative. It works for everyone. I, I, also, I also don't see in, in a UBI system... And maybe I'm just not thinking the UBI system through all the way, but it it still feels like you end up right where you started with people still going into debt, massive corporation. I mean, I I know in a in a UBI yeah. system you get kind of a, a socialist utopia to go along with it, um, where this doesn't happen. But I I, I still and this thing too. I I just in terms of um, in terms of kind of like a, a full kind of Marxist style system. I, I I still want private enterprise. Um, I, I still think you, you don't, you, you need risk takers to essentially guess what it is that you're going to want to buy in the future that doesn't exist right now. 
Um, and I think a job mm-hmm. guarantee provides the best of both worlds where you one part of a mix, one part of a mix. Yeah. Where you don't stagnate. You also, gro- you also got to solve growth. the Marxist problem, identified under capitalism, which is ac- accumulation. So yeah, the, the Pareto dynamics, if you don't solve that, then it becomes hard to sustain uh, a job guarantee because if the oligarchs seize back control of government, yeah, then yeah. Uh, they just scrap the job guarantee program yep. and go back to go back to near. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, because if they see, so they it's can. About, yeah. yeah, so it's really important that when we have a job guarantee, maybe don't rush it through. It's got to be it's got to be done in a way that FDR did Social Security. It's like no one will ever remove it or take it away it'll be politically impossible yeah to, uh, to stop it because people see the benefit so that's why i'm very worried if a neoliberal job guarantee happens <laughs> well <laughs> they do yeah. it really aggressively so they do do the work fair or something like it which is basically the system we've got at the moment is unemployment benefit you kind of in new zealand you have to you know sort of show that you're looking for a job and everything uh job that is you know not, that there are 90 bones for and you're the hundred yeah. month dog. Yeah. Um, God, we're so far away from so much of this ever being implemented. That's the sad part is unfortunately, I don't know. maybe not. I don't, I don't know. know. You think, you think uh, maybe yeah. revolution is coming? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I think MMT is a kind of a revolution. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think revolutions have to be violent. <laughs> Like I said, it's intellectual revolution. What's a what's a like, major yeah, revolu- what's a major revolution that occurred that changed a core paradigm of society that flipped uh, without violence and not even like uh, you know war violence, but just even you know the mass destruction of well, uh, there were martyrs in women's rights. But not too many, and yeah, that's a good point. They okay. didn't have to, they didn't have to happen. Okay, yeah, there certainly were martyrs and civil rights, but that was because of the racism. Yeah. I mean, that, I mean, violent. I think there was a not, lot of not violence because of that, the civil rights activists yeah. were violent. No, but the pushback so, to yeah, not give up. Yeah, so I think you, I think in a in a significant revolution, you do you do have a few martyrs. Uh, that's where I think MT is not so bad because, uh, well. We've already got martyrs. Everyone who dies from poverty, right? So, yeah, in that sense, yeah, there's always violence inherent inherent in in this, uh, and we're trying to overcome it. But yeah, I'm not. Is, I'm not saying the system in yeah, places bringing out yeah. a semi-automatic weapon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's not the way to go. I'm not. Just for the record, I am not <laughs> advocating that. I'm. I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying. You know what is what is the catastrophe that needs to happen to open the oh, door? Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? I mean, what is wet bulb conditions across mainland China? Yeah, yeah. Maybe that's it. Uh, and, and that, I guess that's my point. I would call that violence. I know that's not, you, you know, okay. Right. I mean, no, that's not, but it's not, it's not us taking up. Correct. The yeah. Like yeah. This. But it's, it's, it's nature yeah. imposing it. Yeah. Um, true. No, I'll take your point. This well, well made, but yeah, yeah. Our, our way to combat, to win the class war is, is, um, by intellectual, intellectual struggle and violence. Yeah. Intellectual violence, like, you know, really dunking on people who are stupid. Troll, trolling <laughs> is the way that we're going to get there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> one, one but, troll, but only one using cuss words when absolutely necessary. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> speak, yeah, speaking of which, once uh, they become a lost cause, YouTube's really cutting down on uh, on swearing, so I gotta I gotta watch my language. Oh, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. God, I think Thanks, I've, yeah. I've let a, I know I've let a few I've mind. let a few one a few of them slip. Um, we did get some we did get some comments. I'm going to go back up. Um, yep. uh, I'm, I'm going to have to read this out loud because I'm not entirely sure <laughs> if I read it all the way. Sorry, okay. sorry if it's off topic, but can I ask a question? Just because it's uh, in the news about three pubs in the house, but do you think there will be any momentum on cutting taxes that actually that'll actually get through? I could see it happening, right? I mean, because the Republicans need a win, right? So if they can get some tax cuts pushed through, yeah. they can say they cut taxes. Any, you know, the other thing too is, um, you know, po- politicians yeah. are 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 stupid, but they're not dumb. Um, 
And I think, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, if they, it's kind of like buying when the stock market's low, when the, you know, when the, when the economy's on the downswing, cut some taxes, take, uh, take credit a year and a half later when just the natural cycle kicks things back yeah. up and say, yeah, see, it was the tax cuts that did it. Right. Um, right, right. so I, I can see the, And like Thomas said, the Ayn Rand force is strong with them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but, yeah. but the tax cuts do do have a boost. So, yeah. yeah, and the tax cuts will work too. And I mean, the good the good news is I know they will always talk about cutting spending, but usually that never actually happens. So then you end up getting you, like a double boost. Did anyone here? Did anyone here catch the um, interview that some institute did between? Uh, oh gosh, what what who was Trump's uh, treasury advisor guy? Uh, he was the name oh god. I want to say Geithner, but that was well before Trump. <laughs> what was the goofball's no, no. name? I've got the some. Goofball, dude. Yeah, he did an interview with Randy Ray. Oh, okay. What's his name again? He's got a very, uh, you know. Uh, Mnuchin. White, uh, Mnuchin. Thank you. Name. Steve Mnuchin. No, it was the other guy who came in later. Um, the, uh, the guy used to be on. Uh, was he a Treasury Secretary? Uh, maybe Treasury. The guy used to be on. Uh, in the Fox News or something like that. Oh man, um, Steve, someone. Now, who's a Steve? Well, Steve is that's Mnuchin. Oh, the other guy, the other Steve. I think Stephen Moore. Is it Stephen Moore? Stephen yeah, yeah. Moore. Okay, yeah. So yeah. Have, a, have a look at that. This is a bit where they're debating, like, and Randy Ray's like saying, you know, that FDR. The new deal and all that that was what made america you know all that investment and the highways and yeah. everything it, it 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 made america and steve what steven moore is like you know it did the opposite no it just uh, it just you know crippled what we were capable of doing <laughs> it's like completely <laughs> opposite and then there's this point where where the where the host is asking them what what they what should happen uh you know to have a good covid recovery because this was in the middle of covid and and Steve Moore was saying, well, we're going to have a V-shaped recovery because <laughs> we're just going to cut taxes. And then, uh, you know, Randy Ray says, probably more L-shaped because it's going to drag on, you know. But but when he said cut taxes, Randy Ray says, well, I'll do you one better. I think we should make the uh, payroll tax zero. <laughs> and this guy, Stephen Moore's face just lit up. He was like, he was like, yeah. It was like for a second there, he just loved MMT. Amen, brother. Oh yeah, man. Amen. Yeah. God. Amen. Yeah. That was funny. Randy Ray uh, outdoing the, the the tax cut dude by saying, "Oh, I'll just all payroll tax holiday go to zero. Yeah, cut taxes and sales yeah. tax go to zero. <laughs> you know, this guy Moore was just like, oh, what? Hang on. I bet it. I bet it <laughs> hurt him. I bet it hurt thing? him on. I bet it hurt him on the inside though to uh, to even oh, yeah. acknowledge that a tax on you know uh, we should suspend a tax on working people though right like it should only be know. a it's it instant body re body language reaction was it okay was okay like, like total like oh yes Wonderful. yeah there's okay. a professor who agrees with me okay the one okay. professor in the world <laughs> okay because usually the right wingers only want to cut taxes that uh, benefit you know the increase in yeah. asset prices yeah. not just you know workers but good okay. Um, yeah. That's funny. He must have be. He's probably full on Ayn Rand. I think follower. So when he when he just anyone who says yeah, it's a good idea to cut taxes, they're just like they'll jump on it and go, yeah, what what that MIT guy said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, the FICA tax cut, man. Although to be uh, to, to be completely honest here, um, I, I need that FICA tax in place because actually that gives us some really good economic data yeah, to, yeah. to track yeah, we're going to tell warren to hush up yeah so yeah, warren yeah actually assassinated man you i know actually need didn't. that i actually need that because it'll <laughs> screw up my model so did look guys i'm sorry i'm sorry you get you know 20 percent of your paycheck ripped right out of your hands before you even get it but um yeah we need it for our data yeah doug doug needs it for his work so uh i mean i know the government doesn't need it either <laughs> i mean i'm realizing that no one needs yeah, it. It would take us a whole week yeah. to try and figure out another. Thing. Yeah, so yeah. How the hell am I supposed to? Yeah, this that would be absolutely. That would be absolutely. Yeah, on. and then I'd have to go. Even when I found out how to, how to, uh, uh, you know, how to, how to figure out how to get to it in some sort of backdoor way, then I'd have to normalize my data to this new backdoor way. Yeah, I don't want to go through that work. Yeah. So Come Warren, on. 
if dude if you're watching just cut it on the fica tax man it's like yeah this is this is really necessary data for us um I'm enjoying the third hour, man. I'm enjoying the third hour. And you know what? We're not we're not losing any viewers. So we haven't even got uh, into wormholes. Yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We haven't got into wormholes. Yeah. In PDX, you think? Yeah, Ken, no Ken PDX this week. Um, so maybe no wormhole discussion, but uh, uh, maybe next week. Um, what else? What else? What do, what else do we got? Um, anything else? I, I, I derailed us from salary for life. Uh -huh. Josh uh, is uh, just giving some good uh, feedback in the chat, yeah, which probably I agree with. Yeah, job guarantee would be a massive advantage. Why not? Why not maximize your potential output and in a nice way that's not punitive? I can't yeah. see any downside to it. I'm sorry. Oh yeah, well, Josh again with when Warren was on the Fox News Business Channel with uh, what's his name? That was pretty hilarious. Was it Stuart? Because at first it, the guy it... just instinctively reacted against Warren. He's like putting him down. Like he said, Warren says, ah, oh, tax cuts, you know, zero FICA tax. And the guy was saying, yeah, but hang on, what about, wouldn't wouldn't that like Stuart Harney? Yeah. And then his, yeah. his buddy goes like, no, 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 he's he's proposing a tax cut. Tax cut. And then he, <laughs> then he has to, you see his brain reboot. <laughs> it's like, it's a hilarious clip. Stuart Varney, yes. They Stuart, I think, I think someone uploaded that, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. Stuart Varney. It's almost as good as the BBC guy who's a, who's a right winger, the journalist, when he interviewed Ben Shapiro. There's some similar moments to that, which is just hilarious. hilarious. I'm looking it up right now. I can't find it. I remember. Uh, yeah, I can't find it. Uh, Fox. It's. Uh, I know it's on, on YouTube. I think so. Yeah, it's on YouTube. I yeah. think someone uploaded it. Yeah. A bunch of other videos are coming up before it. I'll have to... Yeah. Yeah. I'll have to dig for it. I think I've I think I've seen it before. Um what else? What else do we got? Anything else? Any other questions? I mean, if anyone's got anything lingering too. Um I've heard more make the point. That, yeah, job guarantee. Um If the Shapiro have <laughs> he would have disappeared. Did you see uh, how? Did you see how he? So embarrassing. Did you see how he tried to? What's the meaning of life? Oh man. No. Uh, no. Um, no. Shapiro tried to actually justify his comments about selling selling the the coastal the coastal land to other people when the. When the, uh, when, the, down, when the when the when the when the when the tides start coming in is uh, the, uh -huh. the Bill O'Reilly uh -huh. tides, uh, yeah, it, and you try to say, well, no, you know, it would happen slowly but surely, and you know, people would just pay a really low price for it because they know they wouldn't have it right. for too long, yada yada yada. And okay. It's like what what? Mm -hmm. No man, um, if if you know your house is going to be destroyed in five years' time, no one's going. Doesn't to, it add to value of real estate because you're going to instant free swimming pool in the back yeah exactly hey man okay listen i live in michigan i live in michigan and i have always said this global warming thing is about to make michigan like the epicenter of uh, of, pro uh you know high high property value right because i'm i'm surrounded i am i am about an hour away from uh from any of the largest uh fresh water bodies of fresh water in the entire world yeah winters used to be cold they're about to get warm summers are going to be nice and nice and toasty yeah, we're we're in a good yeah. spot here in Michigan. Yeah. Florida, on the other hand, I don't think anyone wants a saltwater pool uh, as the oceans begin to <laughs> to get push higher. <laughs> uh, salt water, I don't mind. A few sharks to yeah keep keep your training swimming training going. Thomas D, a cosmic oh, uh, cosmic skeptic fan. I've, huh? I've, wa I've watched my my fair share of cosmic skeptic. Um, cosmic skeptic is a as a YouTuber. Uh, uh, yeah, smart smart guy, smart kid. He's pretty, I think he's pretty young. Um, yeah, yeah. Hey, <laughs> yeah Aquaman is gonna buy the property. Yeah, yeah, yeah. true. Yeah, yeah. He's. <laughs> uh, you know, guys like Ben Shapiro or Jordan Peterson are, are so dangerous because they say 
10%, like 10%, uh, 40% of what they say, 30% of what they say is just sometimes obvious, right? There, there's not any, there's not any real, uh -huh. right? There's not any real insight to anything that they say. Uh -huh. and it's generally agreeable. Uh, yeah. Maybe for some it would be less, right? But it's, it's the other mm -hmm. 70% that they say uh, just, uh, uh, they, they build upon some of the obvious things that, you know, just, just any observation you might have in society that might not feel right. You know, you can make that observation, uh, but it's when they, they pile yeah. in the other 70% of the stuff, um, kind of like a Trojan horse, uh, uh -huh. that, that no one really you right. know, checks on. And I think that's how they get just so, so dang popular, um, as they can say. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh. They have a bigger following than I do. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of confirmation bias going on there. Yes. Yep. People, uh, just, uh, yeah, reinforcing pretty bad narratives. Yep. Yep. Like, so if you've got a family family member who's Ayn Randy type, yeah, you just like tread with caution. It's like, <laughs> um, it's hard. It's hard even to just start with the Pompeii story for them. So uh, what you got to do is sit back, listen, and wait for a um, wait for an opportunity to find something positive that they say you can latch onto. Maybe I don't know. I don't have any Ayn Rand people in my family. My in-laws have a um, one of these New Age type um, QAnon people. <laughs> you know the type. Uh, crystal healing combined with uh trump as the uh, you know, messiah it's a very weird very weird Mix community of, there yeah. and intersected the new age uh hippies and uh, trumpistas so there, there's no way of talking rationally rationally there so i i tend to focus on people in my family who um you know can have a good discussion with and uh, but I still find people are resistant who think uh, it's a crazy idea to um, uh, to have the government issue its own currency. And um, like, is there something going on now where people just don't understand because they don't have actual notes and coins in their pockets that are, you know, got government oh, yeah, stamps? Yeah, yeah, on them? A, yeah, yeah. What's going on there? I don't know. Yeah, that could be. So, it. so my. Uh, so I, okay, I won't mention names because that that'll be too public. But but there's so there's a family member I'm talking to them, uh, and my brother. So I can mention my brother because he he understands MMT, and he he was working from home because of the COVID. Plus his boss doesn't mind it. He's actually encouraging them to work at home and not not uh, have to commute if they don't want to. So my brother, what he does is he 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 relocates like hundred kilometers away from work. <laughs> Yeah, yeah so now he he's got this huge long train commute but he's in a community where he wanted to move to and anyway and then so the it's a government department and they um they put on all this furniture so that now everyone doesn't have their own cubicle they just have uh workstations you can go to any old workstation with someone else's greasy fingers that have been on the keyboard or whatever <laughs> and you know he kind of hates it right but and then this other family member that i'm talking to is uh, talking about how I, yeah, it's a bit of a problem with some of these, how the government departments are working. And I and I just made this this innocent comment like, ah, oh, but, you know, they could just um, hire some furniture or something or hire some better office space or something like this, right? It was, it was related to office space and office furniture, something very sort of mundane. And then, the, then this family member, he says, um, oh, yeah, but, but, my, but my tax is paying for it. Just, just, just inserted that like to stop stop the dead like oh no we can't have that because you know my taxes and so i try to say oh you know that's that's not quite how it works and when what happened instantly was that oh there's no you're just talking over top of me like no it's not you, you don't understand how it's you know more complicated than that and i said no but well you see what how it works is like this and i started talking about the government and then he just talks over top of me he says yeah you think think prime minister ardern can just like you know, pull pull money out of her pocket, and I, I was gonna say, yeah, <laughs> that's, <kind of> how <laughs> that's exactly how it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and but I pulled, I hesitated for too long, and then someone else heard it, and this was at a Christmas dinner thing, right? And then they're like, "Hey, you guys, 
Christmas dinners up because they didn't want us to get in there. Very, <laughs> very anti kind of, you know, heated, heated yeah, conversation oh no, yeah. Christmas. That's what makes that. So one, I, that's what makes family gatherings fun though, man. <laughs> Agreement. No, that's boring. That's yeah, but, boring. It, but it, over the turkey that I, I actually, uh, Weimar Germany came up. <laughs> so there's another family member who thinks they're an expert on history. And I and I'm just going, yeah, you might be, but you don't really know anything about why my Germany hyperinflation, do you? And it's like, and then I got shut down again because because we were still drinking and eating, uh, and uh, like I was I was raising the anxiety level too much. <laughs> but the point is is that uh, find yeah, just listen to conversations. There's there's always conversations in a healthy family where politics gets mentioned even though in new zealand you're not supposed to talk religion or politics over dinner yeah uh, it's no no topics but everyone does so yes. there's always a chance yes <laughs> <laughs> you think the sports but it, but this side of the family isn't so into sports so it does it does lend itself to conversation yeah, yeah, yeah. opportunities the trouble is is that side of the family they are very much into the taxpayer myth it was my side of the family loved talking sports uh, and philosophy and religion. But uh, we, we have far more sports on my side of the family, but they're all totally on board with MMT. So there's nothing, there's no, no one to convince. Debate. Yeah, yeah. No one to convince. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Job's done there. So it's like <laughs> um, family conversations. Do tell us any of your st war stories. You yeah, yeah. I'm always wanting to collect them and see what works, what <laughs> well, works we, well. You know what works. God, what doesn't. We should we should start up. Uh, yeah, we should just start up a, a cult and get uh, get an altar call going and tell us your conversion story or your testimony <laughs> of how you converted somebody else <laughs> to the to the. Yeah. <laughs> to the oh, yeah, we're in a cult. This to is the, a religion. To the, to the cult of MMT. Very evangelicals. Yeah. Yeah, we all we all carry around. Uh, we all carry around. Uh, um, like Nothing a, will ever disprove MMT. Yeah, yeah. We all carry cash like in our me. pockets just to point out the treasury's name is written on the dollar bill. You know, <laughs> we carry on a, a ledger, a ledger and a pencil. So at any time we can yeah, uh, yeah. we can demonstrate uh, balance sheet operations. Yeah, man. Um, I got my I are you ready to go? Yeah, yeah. Trust me, I, I've, I've I've had one time where where we got deep into a conversation about MMT, and all I had was uh, was a, a paper plate and a pencil, and I did hey. balance sheet operations on the bal on the back of that paper plate. Hamel, you know, one of the things too. So uh, one one of my yeah. closest uh, family members uh, is an accountant. Um, he ran uh, his own accounting firm for thirty years. He was in finance. My, my stepdad, he's in finance. Um, I have, he agrees with the balance sheet operations of MMT, but the minute I tell him it's MMT, it's, it's done. There's no, there's no conversation going, going after that. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's wild that he understands, it's wild. Uh, um, yeah. the accounting of it, but, uh, for whatever reason, isn't, isn't that a bit like Perry Merling and his followers? Are they, are they anti MMT? I wouldn't say the anti MT. They just might be not aware. Okay, don't, so don't, I don't want to call it. So MMT. I have a few comments on Daniel Nielsen's blog. I mean, it's going to take me a while because I don't do it every day. But I'm going through Perry Merling's lectures, and Daniel Nielsen has a good blog because he's always good for the balance sheets and and so on. Uh, and that's important for if you're going to you know code a Minsky, uh, Steve King Minsky model. Um, Hi. not that I'm terribly worried about getting those accurate until much later in the Dogbot project. Uh, but it's interesting stuff, but he's, he's very endogenous money. And I, so I have this other activist guy in, in New Zealand and he's, um, he's very, he's a very, he's a Moselarite MMT, or I guess you could say very much transition job guarantee, uh, kind of thinking. And yeah, he talks a lot to Mosler, I think. Um, and so we were, yeah, we had a bit of a conversation about this stuff and he was trying to do a doctoral thesis with Richard Werner, who I think now maybe has resigned from his position wherever he was at Oxford, but I think he's maybe still, still in academia. I'm not sure, but he was going to do a thesis with Richard Werner. And, and I said, just be watch, watch out. Cause I think Werner's a real endogenous money guy. That was just the phrase I used. He's in Dodger's money guy. And 
And my friend, he says, yeah, yeah, he, he'd talk with Moser and Moser thinks the, the same, you know, that um, I don't want to call people out by name. It's just that if you come across any readings of these people who are, I'd say, MMT adjacent, they place a lot more emphasis on uh, endogenous money circuit. And I think their thinking is because because the government still has to sell debt in order to, you know, run yeah. the monetary operations side of thing. Okay, which Randy Ray points out, yes, they do, because it's a backdoor process. And the re repo, reverse repo, blah, blah, blah. Six six step process. Yeah. Which could be done just by typing money into mark up a bank account. But after that six step process, I think I sent this to Jesus a while about a year ago. I don't know if he I don't know if Jesus is still around in the chat, but I think you should remember it. But it's it's on Randy Ray's Brazil series of lectures as well. You can get the six step process. But if you net it all out at the end of the day, and it only takes a day to do the re repos and reverse repos, it is the net effect is the government just marked up a bank account and issued uh, it as a treasury debt, which they're paying to the central bank. So it's the left pocket paying the right pocket, the interest. There's no reason to pay that interest, you know, because it's just the left pocket of government paying the right pocket of government. But if you, before that interest payment is made, it is just marking up an account ultimately. That's what it, uh, the six step process boils down to. So uh, I don't think those folks understand that quite yet, maybe. Yeah. So take, got to be careful when you pass and read those guys. Uh, they're, they're accurately talking about monetary operations. Uh, but I don't think they understand the government side of it and that the central bank is branch government. I, th I think they just haven't made that separate. Yeah. Thing. Yeah, melding in their heads, in their minds, the central bank, at least for the USA, is uh, independent of government to, to them. To them, I don't know why this is, but I think this is a cultural thing in the US that you get taught, is it? Or I don't know. What's that? What's the cultural thing you get from. taught in the US? I don't know. That the Fed is is not controlled by Congress. <laughs> Yeah, I don't well, know. That the Fed, the I, Fed's independence is is like the Rothschilds. Or, yeah, you know. I think that would be. I think. I think. Yeah, I think most people would imagine. I mean, I think most level-headed people would understand that the Fed is effectively an agent of the government. I think less than level-headed people would imagine would would see the Fed as more of a, like a you know <laughs> a conspiracy of the banks. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's a ties, right? I mean, so in Dodgers' money. And MMT don't don't go hand in hand. They are inseparable. Uh, MMT uh, MMT is a superset of post Keynesian economics and institutionalism and Marxism. Superset. So it's always had endogenous money right from the beginning. Um, the the insights that were added was that uh, there is this exogenous money, and it's also a real thing. It's it's not just um, make believe fairy stories. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, tax driven. But there's certainly a lot of post Keynesians who uh, who don't believe in the exogenous vertical money system. They just think it's endogenous, but for good reason. Because you know, you look at the figures; it's ninety percent or whatever. I don't. I forget what the current uh, numbers are, but ninety, ninety-seven percent of currency that you actually have in circulation derives originally from bank credit. It's endogenous money. <laughs> But the three percent or eight percent or whatever it is that is government issue is is a lot of what's supporting that what Douglas talked about that eight uh, percent uh, growth rate uh, that you, you can see your, throughout yeah. throughout all history. Say that That's again. Where, where like, what was the measurement? Can it, can anyone it's, can anyone well chat? in the UK or someone okay. someone someone okay. had a figure it might be really out of date. But I, yeah, I don't know how many people. Yeah, how would you even calculate? I've, I've thought about this and I, I don't know how. It, it, how, how would you calculate Probably you only need to look at one year. Okay. And look at the amount of bank credit. Yeah. And compare with the amount of uh, government net, yeah. uh, government deficit. Mm, it's probably, I, I, it probably is around 90% of it is bank credit. In, it circulates, gets paid off. It's in Dodgers I'm money. Sorry. It's, it's always it's, been part of MMT. It circulates. Okay. Okay. You could be right. Oh, but I mean, it gets saved. I mean, like if you take the credit out, it becomes yeah. someone else's income. Yeah. They, they can save it, which is a leakage, or they can spend it. 
on yeah. their own groceries, but they usually only spend what is it, you know, 80% of it, right? So whenever you sell something, you're going to save roughly 20% and spend roughly 80%, 80%. over the yeah. year. Yeah. Over the year. And uh, that's all coming from bank credit. Yeah. Okay. So only the only the debtor has to repay that, right? And they, they repay it some other way. So if it's circular system, if it circulates fast enough, it, it can stay just ahead of the interest rate. But you've got to keep ever faster circulation. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. You've got to have more babies and everything else, you know. Who become instant capitalists? Yeah. Uh, what else do we got? Any other questions? Yeah, that's right. Randy said MIT is, is a collection of heteroxide, heterodox ideas. It's a synthesis, uh, but it does have some unique contributions that make that synthesis more than just um, glumming things together, right? It's not a mashup. It's it's a coherent story. <clears throat> Josh, I'm looking up. If I can get any data on how much dollar denominated debt Turkey has. Um, yeah. <laughs> Imagine living in Ty Keynes' household. <laughs> hey, man. You can't eat off Minsky GUIs alone, man. Sometimes <laughs> you have to actually get down and code at the machine code level. Uh, <laughs> well, will you uh, wax eloquently about that? Give me one second. I have to step away. I think, okay. we, I think we got some good stuff still to come. So give me one second. I'm kind of laughing at Thomas. Uh, yeah. Let me. I'll, if I'll only be... Biden had vacationed uh, to inquire, if only Warren Bosley had been generous enough to offer him a meal. I don't think. I don't think that's the way we fix the political economy. I, I asked Warren. I asked Randy Ray a question. Well, it was via the host on the webinar he did yesterday. And, um, you know, I, I kind of knew the answer ahead of time, but I wanted to ask the question anyway for the for the audience. It's like, how where should um, headline MMTs and activists focus your energies on the, uh, you know, political leadership, people holding the levers of power or the um, population at large, the electorate, the demos, you know, the, every, everyone in society roughly. Yeah, yeah, and he said, you know, that the political class, the leaders are followers. They're not really leaders. They we we call them leaders, but they uh, are beholden to um, moneyed interests, Wall Street, Silicon Valley, and and of course the electorate, the voters. So if all those people, if people in society are ignorant, then it's very difficult to move uh, the politicians because they're more like sheep. They're not the they're not the shepherd, even though they think they are, and we all we all imagine they are. Then they're, they're not really. <clears throat> but if you disagree with that, yeah, yeah, let me know what you think. Yeah, yeah, Ray's claiming that Ray Randy Ray. Here's a thing. I'm not sure if he's kind of trolling people. I think he's honest about it, but he says, you know, because he and Bill Mitchell were together with Mosler, the sort of quote unquote founders of MMT uh, and how it developed with Kelton and Trinava and uh, Fulstadter and uh, Fulweiler and everyone who got on board later, it developed out of post-Keynesian economics and what Randy Ray says, and I mean, it's just sociology and semantics in a sense, but I think it's correct is that um, they turned post-Keynesian economics into MMT by a few insights that Mosler had on the central banking and a, and a few insights that Bill Mitchell had on the buffer stocks. And uh, what happens is the bulk of post-Keynesian didn't, didn't follow along, and so they kind of split off. But the split was massive, like it was 99% of post-Keynesian stayed old school, and, you know, 1% became MMT, um, but it came out of post-Keynesianism and is a superset because it added to the insights. It didn't subtract. So that's, that's how I think about it. But uh, yeah, history will, history will probably have the last word on all of that stuff. Did you 
do what you want to do there with Turkey? Yeah, yeah, I'm back. I had to step away real quick too. Um, but I'm I'm finding uh, looks like I have a Turkish central bank website, tcmb.gov.tr. Um, I've got a couple things pulled up here. The point I'm going to make <laughs> is, I, I mean, I agree that Turkey cutting rates, actually, before I pull up my, my screen and share it, let me let me get everything pulled up here that I want. Um, I don't really think it, <laughs> if, if you have, it doesn't matter what a country is going to do um, with its rate policy if it's going to borrow in someone else's currency. I, like, it just... Yeah, yeah. Um, I like you know they're they're right in theory. This would just be again. This is just kind of my 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 gut instinct here. Um, I'm, I'm trying to do two things at once. I'm trying to pull up the Turkish lira. It's a bit of a bind, you know. If they if they want to drive more demand for their own currency, they might want to uh, keep increasing their interest rate. If they don't care about uh, inflation, but you know they're they're in they're a Jekyll and Hyde monster there. I think. What is so there? If they think they need to borrow foreign currency because they don't want to use the exchange rate. Then uh, yeah, then they're just uh, tying themselves up in knots a little bit. Um. Yeah, it doesn't look good since they mm. cut the rate. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, I don't know exactly <laughs> when they started doing the rate cuts, but. Um, I do know. I think Warren Mosler posted a uh, posted a video or posted a clip or something on on Twitter saying the inflation rate has slowed down, but certainly relative to yeah, the is... relative to the dollar, we're not really right. seeing any progress. But you yeah, know, people get distracted by the high inflation rate, but you got to look at the re- at the change in the inflation rate. Yeah, uh, as a response to the, some of their policies, and maybe that's a the too many factor but but yeah i agree i mean if they're still gonna uh issue foreign debt then and it's, it's just what i'm uh, seeing here so three billion in islamic bonds on wednesday and its first u.s dollar denominated debt sale since september um okay. I, I think i saw somewhere on one of these sites that like uh, Short-term external debt stock recorded uh, 142 billion at the end of or USD. Okay, but that's their own. Oh, yeah, I don't think. Um, long story short, if a country is still issuing debt, <laughs> another. I mean, that, that just. I mean, that just means that um, you got to get dollars. Haven't got the head screwed on. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you got to get dollars somehow to pay that debt uh, in. Yeah. You know, you're, you're. I mean, if it was me, I'd just default. <laughs> yeah 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 uh start over um, again so i i don't yeah i, I mean it's I, I would expect the, the problem again. occurs when you default and then you go back to the imf and say oh no i've changed my mind i want i want us dollars again <laughs> <laughs> so they don't have their head screwed on yeah i oh, just thinking out loud here Ooh. I think there's a website where you can see all this, but I'm wondering like a country like Turkey or whatever, like what, what is the U S exporting to a country like Turkey that they couldn't get regionally? Uh, right. Like, like, I, I mean, I, I know there's the, the, you know, the petrodollar, um, mm-hmm. right. So I, I mean, I, I understand oil and maybe that's the, the reason they, they need the dollars, but, yeah. Uh, other than that, I don't know. I, I mean, yeah, th- yeah, the do- dollars to get dollars, probably, probably right. <laughs> uh, or dollar denominated assets. I mean, that's another reason why, yeah. too. I think long term, um, you know, the, the S and P does so well relative to relative to other other countries, especially in a in a low interest rate environment is just because if they need to, they can sell the S and P for dollars. Um, <laughs> you know, so you get central banks buying up Apple stock. Um, which <laughs> is, uh, it, it, it almost like it, this is, this is all fun and games at the uh, Rontier level. <laughs> it's like, it's not, 
it's not really talking about the real economy here. So the government doesn't shouldn't be even in that whole game. Just uh, <laughs> yeah. leave the export oligarchs and and rentiers to fend for themselves and stop feeding them. <laughs> feed feed the poor instead. What what sovereign like, what national wealth fund did that? It was Norway, right? It wasn't it Norway, Norway that yeah. bought that bought Apple. I don't know. Uh, could be, could be. <laughs> it's an interesting move because <laughs> they, uh, yeah, they need those, uh, they need those assets. Let's invest in a foreign company. Yeah, yeah. Very strange, epiphenomenal. I, I call it epiphenomenal, but I, you know, I, I'm well aware of the real politic and that, and that it, it impacts um, on on austerity, austerity policies and everything else that follows from this uh, epiphenomenon game that's played with uh treasury bonds and foreign currency transactions and all that sort of thing i just take a hell of a lot of uh crud out of <coughs> the economic system out of the real economy if people stop stop playing around uh, with money in that way and just used it purely as a uh <coughs> way to fund investments and yeah Okay, I just looked it up. Norway lost money. <laughs> they lost money from that? Yeah, on the on Apple, Apple trade. Uh, yeah, and, then, and then in February of 2022, they voted against <laughs> buying more. Okay. I, I am reading these on the fly. <laughs> so, I mean, Google this it's yourself. So, it'd be phenomenal. Man. But uh, <laughs> Norway is $1.3 trillion sovereign wealth fund, a lar uh, the world's largest, will vote against ratification of tech giant Apple management. Oh, no, that's not it. Uh, largest. New Zealand's doing this. Yeah. We, we 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 moved our um, superannuation into uh, a massive you know sort of trust fund and and so the government is making all these uh, investments with uh, the money that it was paying its, itself you know but it was pretending it came from uh, you know pension uh, wage uh, <clears throat> came from wages input into the pension fund. So we play that game too. Jesus, I just think this through for a minute, right? Let's let's say like actually Crazy. let's let's actually think that that for a second. Let's just play it out that buying a stock in a company actually allows them to make a better product, right? Let's just say that, that that's how it okay. plays. Let's just say that's yeah, how it plays that's out. That's the right? idea, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Um so you're literally gonna take your <laughs> financial assets, give it to a foreign competitor. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Foreign competitor. So they can. But to be honest, so you can ensure on, that but, you'll never get that <laughs> that industry in your nation. Industry in your own country. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. yeah. you know, Apple's friendly enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you're ensuring that you will never have the opportunity. And, and when any sovereign wealth fund invests in the U.S., you're just ensuring yeah. that the U.S will continue to have a competitive advantage yes. against you. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> but you can understand, like, I don't think they realize the logic, but it does have some logic, right? So you keep Americans working in the Apple, uh, you know, Cupertino and that. Keep Americans working there. And us Kiwis and Norwegians, we're just sitting around buying their products. So, you know, mm, mm -hmm. playing, playing e-games all day. So you know, do you really want the the Cupertino and uh, Microsoft headquarters in your country, or would you prefer it on some other uh, yeah, soil yeah. and just uh, yeah. feed them your fiat currency, which you yeah, can create? Yeah, you can create. Yeah. So th I couldn't understand the logic. It's just that that's not how they're thinking about it. Okay, well that's fair. So it's not like the Steve Keen argument. You see, Steve Keen versus Mosler trade argument is strategic reserves. So you want to keep domestic um, capacity for uh, you know steel or in new zealand it would be aluminium and wood um but yeah you want to keep some some things that are strategic but i don't think an imac or an iphone is a strategic reserve you need to protect so it's fine yeah, to, that's a good point okay that's a good point yeah it's a good if you're point. a trust fund you know invest and keep keep apple in the united states because you certainly don't want them in new zealand you don't want steve jobs uh, the ghost of steve I jobs to, nah, to, I don't to, want to those to assholes in <laughs> <laughs> i'm happy buying their input you know, buying their well, I don't buy Apple computers; they're rubbish. But um, <laughs> like, 
Pamela, if you're still here, the biggest problem that I'm going to have getting uh, Bijou to play uh, to play some CS is is he's he's on Linux right now, and I, I don't think they have yeah. they have CS on yeah. Linux. So what? No, no, you know, Linux is the kernel. GNU is the operating. GNU, yeah, yeah. Okay. Linux is one of its kernels. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, we, we'll have our industry in New Zealand is just going to be full time. Like either you play rugby or you watch rugby. That's, that's it. <laughs> We'll buy your Apple computers off you to do video analysis or whatever. Or we'll we'll just go to uh yeah, Taiwan and get the uh good uh GPU accelerated GNU yeah. Linux machines. That's where it's at. Yeah. yeah. Do you know how many frames per second you can get on that GPU if you start playing video games instead? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'll digress. Um, I got a question here, which I know you'll want to jump on uh, from Josh. Can I ask if you guys have heard of Richard Vague? I, I, I know you have. Yes. Um, I read his book, A Brief History of Doom, and saw how someone who didn't know yeah. about MMT, I guess, figured out that there's a, a big difference between government debt and private debt. Right. Yes, indeed. Oh, yeah, did Jubilee, right? So, uh, I mean, you know, okay, what Warren Mosley says is that. Um, bankruptcy is already a debt jubilee you just have to make it a little bit less punitive on you know the um credit ratings and all that uh uh so we already do do debt jubilee right you don't need to change anything except for the laws about bankruptcy and it's a i know it's it's a stigma okay so you need to remove some of the stigma surrounding that and the, the advantage i guess of a broad uh entire nation debt jubilee would be that it would be no one would be stigmatized i guess that's a good advantage of that but yeah yeah we're aware of richard vague and and he he's part of the input to dugbot because if you want to have a separate ai system that is sensitive to um a looming minsky crash not just a cyclical recession but an actual minsky crash then you want to look at a ratio of private debt private debt to gdp household debt and its rate of change, which is what Vague um, came up with as his his uh, kind of, you know, 13 keys to the White House that that political economist does. He, it always comes out correct. According to Vague, if you look at the level of private debt to GDP, it's above 150%, and the rate of change of private debt to GDP is above 10% or so, it's going to... Um, that's an indicator for a Minsky type crash. Talking, you know, Great Depression levels, uh, 1960s type crash, uh, 2008 crash. That kind of that kind of a serious crisis. Which at this point, <clears> I mean, I think we're I think we're at that level. I, I mean, I think we're there. Maybe, maybe credit's we? not maybe credit's not decreasing fast enough. I, yeah, uh, increasing credit has to be increasing. Oh, hit a yeah. Yeah, it's it's an accelerator going up. It yeah. causes the instability. The, yeah, the Minsky, the instability is upwards. <laughs> yeah. Let me let me pull up the Fred database here. Um, the good news is, when, when the, I mean the, the benefit of the deep neural network um, is that it, it will learn, it should learn the the perfect equation, right? I mean that's. Uh, if it's a hundred, yeah. I mean, if, if acceleration's not, what, what was it? 10%, you know, maybe it's 10.5 yeah. or whatever. Right. Right. right um, right. I mean that, that is all right. BIS. I'm looking this up. Um, BIS. Well, I don't know if it can be that perfect because it depends on the, uh, mechanism for the Minsky crash because in the great depression, it was, uh, a lot of wall street speculation and so forth in stocks, stock market. And in 2008, it was the real estate subprimes. So, you know, next time around, it might be a, a different a different sector that uh, goes into a pure Ponzi position. Like, it, it, you can imagine it could have been cryptocurrency if, if uh, they'd managed to somehow stop the insanity. <laughs> that could have been a massive, like, it could have taken over, like, I, I mean, I'm just imagining. I, I don't think it could, but, but imagine if it, if it did, it, it would cause a slightly different a change in those parameters i think so it might not be 10.5 percent it might be in that case nine percent or 12 or something like that so 
I don't think an AI could learn that. Learn okay. The precise numbers. Okay. Yeah. So it's going to be vague, as in Richard. <laughs> oh yeah, He's man. He's a credit card mogul. He got out. He got out of credit card industry because he realised it was how it was so unjust and that it was causing instability. So. Yeah, he's a good guy to listen to. Um, the two are, and Ty, if, if you're still here, the two measurements are total credit, the private non-financial sector as a percentage of GDP, and then and then just credit, right? Then then not, not as a percentage of GDP, but just total credit to the private non-financial sector <laughs> The, the rate of change of that. Th those are the two that Richard Vague looks at, okay. right? The two data series. Ah, uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, yep. Private debt. Uh, total. I'm, I'm trying to look this up. Are you doing a freed on this? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to see, cause I know they're on the, <laughs> I know they're on the Fred yeah. site. God, but I keep, Keep, keep yeah. talking, Bijou, while I look this up. And I'll... I wonder, yeah, because the <laughs> last time it. I think I looked it up, it might have been a while ago, but I'll find it. It looked like to me it had gone up and then come down. And so it, it hadn't quite reached uh, Richard Vague danger levels. Okay. But it's, I guess it's been a while since I looked at it. I'm not sure. But, you know, if home mortgages are going up, and I think they are, then then you could be, again, in, in a little bit of trouble with that. Uh so that would be kind of a, a weird twist in the story that, um, you know, the credit cycle starts up again, but it's starting at a higher elevated level. And so um, instead of the MMT narrative being, oh, you know, we're coming out of COVID with a, uh, we're not going to have a full recession. You've got to be careful because uh, if the mortgage debt uh, goes too high too fast, so both too high and too, too fast. And it's you can get a Minsky moment where that again the um, household uh, housing sector collapses again with people defaulting on mortgages. But since it's not a subprime thing, it's not quite the same Ponzi dynamic as two thousand eight. You have to, but I, I did hear somewhere that um, <laughs> CDOs and MBOs and that were ramping up again, like everyone forgot. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we will we will forget i was like oh, what's going on um let's see i'm gonna sh switch over to i think i found the data sets maybe i'm wrong maybe i'm pulling the wrong one from the fred here um the, all the bis data is now in the is now in the fred i i believe at least the u.s is all right so I don't know what I'm about to share, so we're gonna we're gonna all see right. we're, we're gonna all see what's on. Have Doug's. a look. Yeah, have a, have a peek at it anyway. Um, Lift up the skirt there. Yeah, let's do this. We're gonna go to Chrome. Lift up the kilt. Yeah, there we go. There we go. <laughs> um, we're looking at the hopefully the right data set now, and I gotta get my chat uh, up real quick. I think I'm five second delays behind your audio on the. Okay. On, yeah, the, on the live stream yeah yeah, yeah. uh okay yeah That's it. i can see it now so i think this is the total um, credit to the non-financial sector right I, I haven't done rate of change okay. yet on this but i think this is the yeah. the the correct and here's the the series number on the bis okay and then here's total credit to the non-financial sector by gdp and here's can you this, do a correct uh second thing where you or yeah. G, or GDP ratio to GDP. Yeah, yeah. This already is ratio to GDP. So we're we're above oh. the you know we've been above post COVID we've been above the Standard magic GDP. Got it. We've been above yeah. the magic one fifty mark. Yeah. And then we'll do per percent change from a year ago. And we hit. I I know. <laughs> I, I, what? We hit uh, the reading? acceleration. Stupid view map thing, but. Um, here was the 2004 peak of 12%. Okay. Here was the peak, the COVID peak of 15%. Um, I know we had a heck of an acceleration. Uh, yeah, so it's like COVID just so disrupted things. Yes, and that is also part of, I mean, any- It kind of forced a recession on us anyway. And then, yeah. 
yeah it's sort of things haven't reset since yeah the, the so it's hard to so, yeah it'd be very difficult for an ai system actually to be learning uh how to get minsky's from this because um there's not a there's not a lot of historical data to train on uh, where pandemics hit <laughs> yeah. and the neural network's not going to be know that it's a pandemic um but you, if you start to put right inoculation rates into the time series <laughs> <laughs> okay so so ty is saying t closer to 200 percent um as opposed to 150 percent yeah okay yeah so yeah, maybe maybe it's definitely a combination of the two so maybe it was that one 170 range that we got to in 2008 yeah. um but, yeah but then you've got pesky governments like in australia who are always uh you know bailing out the real estate sector <laughs> so they're about to have a minsky crash in real estate in australia and then yeah and then, you know the government just buys up the the bad mortgage debt and everything gets reset so they're they've learned how to kind of uh stall out a minsky crash and that, that was i think there's a is it what is the there's a few scandinavian uh, scandinavian countries that have really high private debt to gdp levels yeah. and have had yeah, them yeah. for centuries at this point yeah. right right um right and, have... and the thing with japan is that uh, is that um you know you just look at uh, the government debt as well and you can see how it's uh keeping control of private debt so it's like it so some yeah some governments have learned how to almost um, i don't want to speak too soon but they've they've learned how to almost um eliminate possibilities of minsky crashes Due, uh, due to anything just in financial uh, dynamics, not not necessarily you know natural disasters like asteroid strikes and <laughs> zombie apocalypse. Yeah. Whoa is is Canada not? Oh, there it is. Okay, I was looking at that. You can't see two hundred private did. Yeah, you're not. You can't see this, but I, I do have the Hang BIS on. worksheet pulled up. That's... Um, I'm looking at the series number to pull them up on the. So is Ty saying that Canada pri levels of private debt are two hundred percent, but it, it's it's sort of stable because the uh, repayment of the debt is sustained by deficits. That's an interesting kind of extreme case. All right, I'm gonna switch to switch to Canada here. Hopefully, I think these are all in the the Fred. Yeah, so it's kind of it's kind of opposite to Japan in a way, isn't it? Holy cow! Instead percent of, of, of government debt going up, it, it, they're, they're forcing freaking health health cells to live like, you know, nervous little, neurotic, anxious folks. There's Canada. Um, so Ty, the the way that Steve Keen does it is he is he taking the rate of change or the percent change from a year ago of private debt to GDP, or is he doing what he just calls credit, which is not relative to GDP? Um, so in other words, I take this time series as a ratio of GDP, but then I have to you know, get rid of the ratio portion and just do the, the, the change in debt. Is that what he's doing? Mm. Is, is like the, the accelerator component? Uh, um, oh, you got to be careful with Steve Keen. What he calls credit. That's it's, and that's what that's I'm right. asking. I mean, that's Trade what I'm asking. Changes it. We got to calibrate there. <laughs> yeah, and that's and that's what I'm asking. Like, am I am I yeah, essentially am I am I doing it the way that that Richard Vag and Steve Keen would yeah, kind of well, define? That's right. Because what I thought right Richard Vag was doing was was yeah. our uh, definition of credit, which yeah. is the the um, not the rate of change. But, uh, anyway, yeah, it gets confused. So, I mean, it, it's quite the acceleration, if I'm, if I'm doing this correct, for Canada as well, that they're coming off of. Um, so clearly they've, they've figured out, Steve does change of the stock, so debt, which I think I just did, yeah, okay, I think that's what I just did. I mean, I, I think this is the right series that I'm taking. Okay, I could be wrong. Um, so, so, so by my measure, I mean by that measure, Canada's in rough shape, right? Um, yeah, we're in rough shape. 
but this well now they've yeah i guess now would be the the bust portion um anyway we've hmm. uh we've gone on now for we're, we're getting close to almost three and a half hours so oh really okay time to it's been fine. If there's anything else that needs to be brought up, we can, we can do it. If there's any last minute well, questions you know, that, that come in, anyone's still listening. Yeah, we like, are. Uh, we are starting to, to, uh, trickle, trickle down in viewership. So, um, it has been a fun time. If there's any questions, you know, send them, send them through last minute as we, uh, as we sign off, I'm just scrolling back up in chat real quick. See if there's anything here. Uh, yeah, we hit the Richard vague. Yeah. All right, I would I would call this a very uh, successful, fun live stream. Thanks everyone. Yeah. For it's like, oh, you have this. We have to go out on something, like you know, for next week. Oh. Can we do a nineteen seventies uh, Batman thing? Oh, a, a, a good a bolstering good, bankers, a good, bolstering a good, bankers, a good, Douglas. A good Douglas. <laughs> next good. week, will the Bose Latron? G GT nine hundred be able to rescue Princess, <laughs> Steph Princess Stephanie Kelton from the diabolical clutches of the um, medically sealed academic Zoom room chats. This is you're a natural Adam West <laughs> if I've ever seen one. Like, um, <laughs> where the air is precariously stale and it's running out. <laughs> Will she survive the chats? Tune in next week. Same uh, MMT time, same MMT channel. <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely show up. I need the American accent. Um, <laughs> The, the the yeah we'll we'll see we'll see what we can uh have for next week i appreciate the outro um it's been it's been fun uh i, I do i do gotta just put in the one plug um especially i i know everyone watching is probably well aware of the patreon but uh if somehow you stumbled across this live stream you've made it this far it's intrigued you uh you want in mm or patreon.com slash mmt macro trader uh, is where you can find both the trading models that we're putting together, the uh, the macro analysis. If you're an active investor, active trader. If you're not, just disregard any of the <laughs> active investor stuff. I don't don't sign up for that unless it's something that that you actually are. Um, and if you just want to support what we're doing, we do have a tier for ten bucks a month. Um, you can check that out as well. We're going to be posting. Uh, any of the research that is kind of core research that's not the trading models, it's going to get posted there. So we're going to have some some fun stuff heading up uh, or being posted very soon. And and Bijou's written up some blogs already that Doug just needs to finally post. So uh, so we'll have that for that tier. Um, and then I'm creating a third tier we're working on on getting kind of the dashboard and all that stuff done for kind of a middle tier for just kind of more market watcher type. Um, but that's how you can support us if you want. Plug out of the way. Um, have a good night, everyone. Bijou, I don't know if you have any final words uh, on the way out here, but uh, yeah, it's been been quite a lot of fun um, tonight. So yeah, that's what I got. Yeah, it's been fun. All right, hear nothing else, see nothing else. As always, good trading, everyone, and we'll uh, we'll talk to you next time. Good evening. Good night. Good day. Bye. <laughs>